I just started I am... the I just started the recording, guys, so that you know. Perfect. So we're now recording to the cloud, um, and you can press it uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, so I'm gonna press to start the webinar, and then we are uh, just to be live. Okay. Okay. Sure. See you there. Okay, so we should be live now. Hello, uh, welcome to the uh, last in the series of general adversarial collaboration workshops from the uh, Computation and Cognitive Neuroscience um, Conference. Um, my name is Eric DeWitt and I'm co-hosting today with uh, Gemma Rui. And we are here to present um, uh, a workshop that uh, we'll talk about in a second. First, I want to introduce the concept of our GAC program. Um, so this year we were not having our annual uh, conference and so the CCN program committee, um, which is here, Nicolou Kriegerskort, uh, Gunnar Bloom, Megan Peters, Ralph Hefner, Gemma Ruig, Eric DeWitt, and Jennifer Lieberman, um, we decided to do something different, which we thought would take advantage of the disruption that's happened this year to use the online forum to try to generate um, some new initiatives. And I uh, wanna make a special shout out here to Megan Peters. She actually had the inspiration uh, for this uh, workshop concept and uh, has been really a driving force in making it happen. So what are the GACs? Well- so, Eric, Eric, just a second. I don't see we see the slides. Uh of uh, your screen, of the presentation. Ah, okay. Do you see them now? No. No. Okay, hang on, let me reshare. I apologize, everyone. That's okay. Um, so let's try this again. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so welcome to the General Adversarial Collaborations Workshop on Recurrent Neural Networks. Um, I just introduced the CCN 2020 Program Committee. Um, we have uh, taken on this special initiative this year to try to generate a set of new collaborations to take on problems that we think are ripe for progress. Now, we think that science benefits from um, alternating ideas and theories and competition, but too often we focus on trying to prove our own theories correct without actually trying to interact with uh, opponents of our theories or uh, trying to engage with other experimental data. So what we wanted to do is bring something about where people who have alternative viewpoints come together to collaborate and resolve their differences or at least clarify them. So this is why it's an adversarial collaboration. Um, the best way we, we hope to do this is by initially doing a series of workshops where the groups come together. They have already presented proposals and received feedback from the community. And now this is your opportunity to engage with them. They're going to present uh, the various aspects um, of a competing set of theories. And the result of this workshop will hopefully be further engagement. We encourage all of you to engage with the workshop organizers to try to facilitate their process. Um, in, in this case, we hope that this will lead to a position paper, potentially a series of experiments and a presentation at the uh, following CCN event, which may or may not be uh, virtual. And why do we think this is important? Because in fact, healthy, uh, friendly, collaborative processes should also be one where we bring together differing ideas, we bring together theorists and experimentalists, and we work together to not only resolve the underlying problems, but to, to clarify what the problems are for the larger community. Okay, so we've, um, we're really interested here in doing something in an open science way. We really want this to be an open public debate. We want your participation. Throughout this workshop, please ask questions using the question and answer system in our Zoom webinar. We will try to answer many of those questions live, but, but if you would like to comment, you can actually comment on or add to questions that are already posted there. The, the panelists uh, from the workshop will also answer your questions and there will be room for full debate towards the end. 
um, in, in the property of, of these workshops, we really wanna to bring together diversity. There's no bad ideas. We'd like to bring together insights from theory, experiment, and across the domains from systems to cognitive neuroscience. Uh, this started with our open review process and hopefully it will continue through the entire GAC process, which we hope will lead through this year um, and, and into the next uh, CCN conference time at the, the beginning of next fall. Um, so this is a kickoff workshop. Um, and it's something that uh, we hope that uh, you guys are going to enjoy. Um, so the, the goal today is to hear about um, the dimensionality and flexibility of learning in biological recurrent neural networks. And I'm just gonna plug that there's another workshop coming up immediately following this one called Do Grids Afford Generalization and Flexible Decision-Making? And with that, let's make this a success. And I'm going to turn it over to Luke to start off this uh, workshop. So uh, Luke, floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so let's, let's quickly get this started. Uh, at the top, you should see uh, a, a code for menti.com, which is where we've set up a poll just to kind of get a sense of what the views are on a few sort of important topics, uh, sort of a range of important topics on in, in this uh, in, in learning and biological recurrent neural networks. Uh, so if you can if you can head there and and sort of quickly do it, you can do that in your browser or on your phone. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very quick. Um, so so yeah, the so sort of this this workshop sort of start like came about from uh, like a, a, a debate that me and Blake were having that sort of spun out from a uh, a, a discussion between ours and Rui, Rui Costa's lab um, and, and Richard Noe's lab on temporal credit assignment. Um, and so, you know, there seems to be quite a, a, a set of sort of contradictions between uh, experimental evidence and sort of the success of uh, learning in, in artificial recurrent neural networks. Um, and, and so trying to, trying to sort of bring together how these things can, can be aligned better and how we can uh, sort of resolve what the difference between biological recurrent neural networks are and sort of bring them up to the to the to the success of of or the sort of apparent success of what we think humans are capable of or animals are capable of and what uh, artificial neural networks are capable of so we're first going to start with Katerina, uh, Katerina Vilmos, who's going to give us a, uh, a sense of the physiological background of the kind of constraints that we're working with in biological recurrent neural networks uh, we're then going to be followed up by Blake Richards giving an account of the biological plausibility of uh, backpropagation through time and real-time recurrent learning. And then we're finally going to have uh, Rui uh, Pontecosta uh, detailing a few of the alternatives to backpropagation through time that are uh, perhaps more biologically plausible. Uh, we're then going to have a quick break where we're going to put up this poll again. Um, and then uh, finally, we're going to have a panel discussion where we're going to include Christina, Christina Savine and Wolfgang Maas, uh, and, and also anyone from the audience who has uh, something, something strong that they want to say. Uh, perhaps if they very, very agree, really disagree with the panelists in some sense. Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely, definitely looking forward to, to hearing from you all. Um, so yeah, quickly here we um, here we have a bit of a breakdown of, uh, of of what you what your views are with in, in terms of temporal credit assignment. Uh, you can kind of see that there's quite a lot of agreement in in terms of how uh, how important it is for the brain to estimate gradients through time, and um, you know, agreement that there's there's a, a but there has to be biological mechanisms for this. Um, kind of a, a, a bit more of a spread of opinions in terms of how, how local that information should be, and we'll, we'll be sure to cover that during the panel debate. Um, then finally, yeah, kind of, it seems like most of you agree that plasticity is key to learning and memory throughout life. Um, I'm hoping to challenge some of that perhaps during the, during the, uh, during the panel discussion. And finally, yeah, again, like a big, a big spread of opinions on, on whether um, uh, the importance of evolutionary pre-wired recurrent circuits, uh, how important they are for, for learning. So anyway, I'll, I'm going to pass you over to Katerina, Katerina Vilmos now. Uh, Katerina is a, a, a researcher at the University of Bern working with Jean-Paul Fister uh, on uh, theories of predictive coding in the brain. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me for, to this exciting workshop. I hope you can all see my slides now in my mouse. 
Yes, great. Okay, so um, before we come to the artificial recurrent neural networks, I would like to talk about what we know about learning in uh, actual biological networks, like the brain, for example. And, um, oh, sorry. Now, okay. So, um, because uh, artificial recurrent neural networks are inspired by biological neural networks, they have some common ingredients. Like, for example, the activation of units in artificial neural networks corresponds to firing rates in neurons. The um, connections between these uh, units in the artificial neural networks and their weights corresponds to synapses and the synaptic strength. And the weight change in these networks that is very important for learning and for training these networks corresponds to synaptic plasticity. And um, before I come to uh, interesting properties of biological neural networks that might be important for learning algorithms, I would like to talk about, about two very simple biological constraints. And um, they are very trivial, but they are sometimes forgotten in artificial neural networks. So that's why I mentioned them again. So um, neurons um, fire action potentials and because because the neuron cannot fire a negative number of action potentials, um, firing rates in neurons are positive. And um, this can be solved in artificial recurrent neural networks by having rectified activation functions. Um, second, uh, the connections between uh, neurons in a biologically plausible neural network should follow Dale's law. Dale's law says that the neuron is either excitatory or inhibitory. Of course, it's biology, exceptions apply, some neurons can change from excitatory to inhibitory, but I think the common rule is that a neuron does not change consistently uh, from excitatory to inhibit, uh, inhibitory, so what we should uh, distinguish is different cell types, we should have excitatory and inhibitory cell types in a biologically plausible neural network. Um, synaptic plasticity which corresponds to weight changes in artificial neural networks is important for learning. And we also have that in the brain. So um, in the brain, connections between cells um, are not fixed. They can change. And these changes depend on the neural activity, which in turn depend on the sensory input. And uh, this is a very important property because this makes it possible for the brain to learn from experiences if the synaptic plasticity depends on the input, on the experiences, and also enables to form memories. So far, so good. So this is similar in artificial neural networks. But now comes um, what might be different, namely the learning rules. They are not the same in artificial neural networks and in biological neural networks, I would argue. And I would like to tell you a bit more about um, how learning happens in biological neural networks. So um, Hepp, Donald Hepp, a neuroscientist in 1949, he came up with a, a great idea. Um, he came up with a learning rule according to which uh, synapses should change. And he said that if we have a recurrent network like this in the brain, and we have neuron J, which projects to neuron I, then um, when J activates before I, then this uh, connection should become strengthened. And this makes sense if you, um, I give you a very um, trivial example. Um, it makes sense if, for example, neuron J fires when you see your grandmother. Um, and neuron I fires when you see a cake. And then if you repeatedly see your grand and then the cake and the grandmother and the cake, so every Sunday you go to your grandmother and you get a cake afterwards, and every time this connection strengthens a little bit, um, then just seeing your grand will cause this neuron eye to fire such that you can already imagine the cake um, without actually seeing it. And therefore, happy and learning um, enables us to learn an association between the grandmother and the cake. What is important about this um, biological rule is that is a, it is local. So um, the change of the weight WIJ uh, depends on the activity of neuron J and depends on the activity of neuron I, but it does not depend on the activity of neuron K. Maybe it can depend on the weight itself. This is possible. So we can write that the change in the synaptic weight WIJ should be a function of J, I, and the weight itself, but it definitely is not a function of K. Um, so this rule is local in space for sure. Is it also local in time? So um, it's obvious that um, this weight change should depend on the present activity of J and I. It's not so obvious how it can depend on the past activity of J and I. Well, if it depends on the weight itself, of course, the weight itself is a function of the previous activities of I and J. It can maybe indirectly depend, depend on those activities, but it's not very obvious how it can depend on those things in the past. Um, I'm just giving you one example of a simplest Hebbian rule. So because this just says it's a function. So one Hebbian rule could be just taking the firing rates of neuron J and I, multiplying it by a learning rate, and then this way you get the weight change. Um, 
I'm mentioning this locality of the rule because this is a challenge for artificial neural networks, as we will see in the uh, presentations by Blake and Rui later on. Okay, so there's um, physiological evidence actually for something like heavy plasticity in the brain. In the 90s, 1908, B and Poo showed um, that when they measured connection strength between uh, two cells, so they basically evoked a spike in this cell and then looked at the response in the other cell, they measured the strength of this synaptic connection, and then they did a plasticity induction protocol where they evoked spikes in the two cells with a certain uh, difference in time delta t. Um, and when they did this first in the presynaptic cell and then the postsynaptic cell, after 60 of such pairings, they observed that the synaptic strength increased, which is exactly what HEP um, proposed. Um, they varied this delta T difference, and this is plotted here on the X axis, and then looked at the synaptic weight change. And um, they saw exactly that pre before post timing would give you a potentiation of the synapse, while post before pre-timing would get you a depression of the synapse. So this is called classical spike time independent plasticity. But um, let me tell you that this is not always the case in the brain. Um, there are many different forms of spike time independent plasticity. They depend on where we are in the brain, which brain area we're we looking at, and also which cell type. For example, excitatory to excitatory cells seem to have very different rules from excitatory to inhibitory or inhibitory to excitatory uh, connections. Also, it depends on the location of the synapse within the cell. It depends on the frequency of the stimulation and may, many other factors. So we have a diversity of learning rules in the brain. One last thing about heavy and plasticity. Heavy and plasticity also poses problems for um, network stability because it introduces a positive feedback loop. So because the um, weight change was dependent on the activity and inc it further increases the activity of the cells, this activity increase further in the, increases the weights such that we have a positive feedback loop and um, we can easily get to pathological activity where firing rates explode. So um, here's an example. Um, this is a raster plot of a, a spiking neural network, y-axis are the neurons, x-axis is the time, and we see a synchronous irregular activity without any plasticity. If we now put in just heavy plasticity, we get a, an explosion of the network activity. Therefore, in um, models of plasticity, we always need some homeostatic mechanisms that keep track of the firing rate of the network and then limit the amount of potentiation, increase the amount of, of um, depression, or just limit the uh, synaptic weights um, with an upper limit, for example. So there are different ways to do this with synaptic scaling, inhibitory plasticity, or presynaptic inhibition. Um, and there are reviews out there where can, you can have a look at this. Um, but now I want to talk more about um, the neurons in the network, because um, they are usually very much simplified in artificial neural networks. They are just considered to be a point. However, in biological networks, um, cells have dendrites. So these are the input structures where all the synapses are, where they're receive their inputs. And as you can see, the soma, the point that we've been modeling before, um, is just a tiny part of the cell. And interestingly, these dendrites are compartmentalized in that um, the apical dendrites, which um, uh, come out of the soma on the apex of the soma, and the basal dendrites, which um, extend from the soma in the other direction, they, they are very much separated from each other by the soma. So in principle, a cell can integrate different kinds of inputs independently from each other to give a response. Um, and this is especially interesting because also the inputs to the cell are compartmentalized. Um, Top-down inputs tend to arrive on the apical dendrites, while bottom-up inputs arrive um, closer to the soma. So this is also a very interesting property of these cells. And they are not just anatomically compartmentalized, they are also physiologically um, compartmentalized because different parts of the cell express different ion channels and therefore an enable different dendritic computations and nonlinearities, as we, we will see in the following. And also soma and dendrite, they can talk to each other. So when we, for example, um, inject current into the soma of such a cell, uh, we get an action potential that, of course, travels down the axon to the next cell, but it also goes back into the dendrite as a back-propagating action potential. So when we measure um, the voltage here at this electrode, we see that um, the spike that was created in the soma, the black trace, also propagated into the dendrite, the red trace. So thereby the soma can talk to the dendrite and these back propagating action potentials depolarize the cell and they can also cause plasticity. Um, if we now um, stimulate the dendrite, we don't see much of that in the soma. But interestingly, we can combine the two stimulations 
the somatic and the dendritic stimulation, and we get a very nonlinear response. Um, that is that in the dendrite, the red trace, we see this plateau potential, which is based on calcium currents, and we know that calcium can induce synaptic plasticity. And this uh, plateau potential also causes the soma to uh, fire two more spikes. So um, on the one hand, um, so this um, cell can do coincidence detection between bottom up and top down inputs. And on the one hand, this leads to plasticity probably in the dendrite and also a change in the firing mode from a single spike to a burst of spikes. And um, this comes, uh, lets me come to the point that plasticity is also compartmentalized in these cells. So uh, before I talked about spike timing dependent plasticity, but synapses can also change um, just without any somatic spiking. And this is made possible by these dendritic um, nonlinearities, for example, also NMDA spikes. So they are um, carried by NMDA receptor channels. They are also based on calcium and um, they occur in the digital dendrites and they can cause plasticity without any somatic spiking. And this calcium spike can also cause plasticity in the dendrite quite independently of the soma. Um, and therefore also um, these cells are compartmentalized in terms of their plasticity. Interestingly, inhibition can modulate um, these responses in the cell. So for example, Matthew Lacombe, he stimulated a layer five parameter cell such that it would give this nonlinear response. Um, but then he also identified an inhibitory cell that was connecting to this excitatory cell. And he injected current such that this inhibitory cell would spike. And just one spike in the inhibitory cell eliminated the calcium response completely. So inhibition seems to have a very powerful control over this um, dendritic nonlinearity. And uh, this, lets, uh, so this leads to the point that neurons are actually diverse. So we do not only have excitatory cells, we also have very many different kinds of inhibitory cells. And I don't have time to go into the detail of their physiological and functional differences. But um, one difference that I want to um, uh, stress here is that they um, target different parts of the excitatory cells. So um, there are different inhibitory cell types that um, go into the distal dendrites and the soma or even the axon. And this is the case in both the cortex and the hippocampus and also other brain areas. And because of this property, the dendritic inhibition can control both the back propagating action potentials, the calcium spikes in the dendrites, the burst firing of the cell, and also the firing rate of the cell it itself, uh, quite compartmental and independently from each other. So inhibition can therefore gate both the activity and the plasticity in the cells. And finally, I would like to talk about neuromodulation, which is also called the third factor in the learning rules of the brain. And why is that? Um, is quite simple. So um, before we said that the weight change um, is a function of pre and post synaptic activity, let's call those the first two factors. Then the third factor is some modulatory input that can change the learning, can either switch on plasticity, switch off plasticity, flip the learning rule, or do all kinds of fancy things. And the neuromodulator um, is, uh, for example, acetylcholine, um, serotonin, oxytocin, or dopamine. And um, these have been associated with different cognitive states like attention, mood, the social context. And dopamine is probably the most popular one or the most famous one that has been associated with reward, success, and novelty. And um, there are some examples how neuromodulation can influence activity and plasticity. So for example, um, there are cholinergic fiber. So this would be the neuromodulator acetylcholine that um, target uh, different inhibitory cell types in the cortex. And by switching their activity on and off, um, this cholinergic modulation can control um, the firing mode of the neuron and also the plasticity. As we've seen, inhibition is very powerful in controlling these things. And thereby, neuromodulation can even be spatially and temporally precise. Then neuromodulation can also be more diffuse, that it's just present uh, surrounding the synapse and thereby can modulate um, the permeability of ion channels and increase the excitability of the cell. There are, for example, neuromodulators that um, increase the permeability or decrease the permeability of potassium channels such that the EPSP duration becomes longer. And there, this kind of neuromodulation would be less temporally and spatially precise, but in, can increase the excitability and the plasticity in the network. Then um, there are also astrocytes surrounding synapses. And um, these can uh, secrete deserine, which modulates um, the availability of NMDA receptors. And NMDA receptors are important for many forms of synaptic plasticity. And thus, this is another form of modulation of plasticity. 
So finally, so therefore, neuromodulation can be more or less temporally and spatially precise. Um, I would like to give one example where neuromodulation has been linked to um, learning in uh, behaving animals, which is very interesting. It's a study by Letzkus et al. from 2011, where um, they did fear conditioning in mice with a tone and a shock. And um, they modified the activity of uh, layer one inhibitory cells and found that when they were optogenetically silencing these cells, that the animal uh, didn't learn the association anymore between the tone and the shock. And uh, they think that the mechanism behind this is the following that um, the unconditioned stimulus to the shock would activate with uh, cholinergic fibers these um, inhibitory cells during learning such that they silence other interneurons such that the parameter cell will be disinhibited, be more active and be more plastic. So this is um, a mechanism of neuromodulation wire inhibition, which uh, seems to be actually happening during fear conditioning. And finally, um, there's also some experimental evidence for eligibility traces, which we will also talk about um, later today. So um, dopamine is a neuromodulator that can convert long-term depression into long-term potentiation, even after it has been applied um, with a dilation after the induction protocol. So if you pair pre and post synaptic activity to get some long-term depression, um, if you then add dopamine later, it can still afterwards um, induce long-term potentiation. So this has been shown in this study by Brosco et al. from Ole Pausen's lab. Um, so this is a very interesting. There are lots of other studies showing this um, experimental evidence for eligibility traces. This is just one example that I'm giving here. OK, with this, I would like to um, summarize. So what I've shown you today is that the learning rules um, in the brain are very diverse, but they are local. So at least I don't have an explanation how they can be non-local. Um, and neurons have dendrites and are compartmentalized in terms of uh, the inputs they receive, the inhibition they receive, and also the plasticity signals they express. Um, inhibition is a super power, powerful thing to gate activity and plasticity in neural networks. And neuromodulation adds a third factor to learning rules, um, usually is thought as a very global and unspecific signal. But I think by targeting inhibitory cells, neuromodulation can also be quite uh, spatially and temporally precise. And there's also evidence for eligibility traces. And um, yeah, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, give the mic on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Luke, I think you're. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just yeah. Thanks very much. Um, uh, next we'll have uh, have Blake Richards. Uh, thanks very much, Katarina. Thanks very much, Eric. Next we'll have Blake Richards, who's going to be talking about the biological plausibility of backpropagation through time and uh, recurrent, re real-time recurrent re uh, learning. Blake's a, 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 an assistant professor at, at Miller and McGill and the Montreal Neurological Institute. Uh, so so we, we had Blake. two clarification questions. I just noticed, though, that they'd been clicked as answered. So I don't know, um, Katarina, if you just want to quickly take a look and see if they should be answered now, or, or you could ask to defer them to later. Uh, one from Zishan and uh, one from Can you read it to me for a second? I don't sure. Are there any uh, quantitative measures of biological plausibility in auto, uh, um, artificial neural networks? Uh, and he asks, does this make sense? Uh, Rui was commenting in the uh, chat. And then the second one is, um, you mentioned that there exist neurons that can change from excitatory to inhibitory and vice versa. What kinds of cells are those? And can you give us some uh, reference? Oh, let me uh, start with the second question. So um, it's known that neurons can express more than one neurotransmitter. So for example, there are GABAergic neurons that also um, uh, release opioids. Um, just one example, but there are like multiple examples, um, but it's uh, not very common that a glutamatergic uh, neuron is at the same time a GABAergic neuron. So there are certain combinations that are possible um, and that with the context or something can change. But I think this is also very uh, like a uh, research field where we don't know much about it yet. And the first one, um, maybe I can answer that in the chat. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, yeah. And we had one last one, which is, um, to what degree is modulation of plasticity, um, I'm going to um, paraphrase here, uh, possible globally versus locally by a neuromodulation? To what extent? Yeah, so uh, I think, um, okay, maybe um, this hints at uh, how precisely can we control uh, the neuromodulation. Um, 
So it's probably not as precisely possible as we would like from an artificial neural network perspective, where we want to change one weight exactly like from a very global signal far away in the network. But I think that um, there are topologies where um, cholinergic fibers can target a certain population of cells that um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to talk about tuning curves, actually. But let's assume <laughs> that uh, they are tuned to some uh, particular um, uh, stimulus and that this can be very specifically modulated by uh, cholinergic fibers by switching off inhibitory cells uh, precisely in time. In that sense, it can, uh, the neural modulation can be like precisely targeted and is not a global signal that affects an entire brain area, for example. But I wouldn't say that this neuromodulatory signal can be as precise as we might need it in some artificial neural network architectures. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And uh, just a reminder to everybody attending, um, please ask questions in the Q&A panel and you can comment on questions or follow up uh, both on questions that are open and also questions that have been marked as answered. You can continue to chat there. Um, so, uh, Blake, would you like to take it away? Sure thing. Thank you. So here, I'll just share my screen. Can you all see my slide now? Yep. Okay, great. So um, I am going to now uh, follow up on uh, Kata's great introduction to the biology of plasticity by stepping back and ignoring the biology for a moment and uh, just asking from an algorithmic perspective, what might you want in a learning algorithm? And we're gonna focus here because it's the, the topic of today on recurrent neural networks. Um, and I'm gonna give you an overview of what the kind of like, as it were, gold standard as it, uh, for, for training recurrent neural networks is, why that might be a useful thing for the brain to do, but also why it's likely something the brain cannot do in the form that we do it in artificial neural networks. Okay, so, uh, so as I mentioned, um, you know, our goal today is to look at the question of temporal credit assignment in recurrent neural networks. And I would argue that this is a big issue. It's something I'm very interested in in my lab. Um, and I think something that many people are interested in. And so let's just first talk about why this is an important thing for us to even be discussing. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the, this all rests on the credit assignment uh, question. And I will give a definition of that in a moment, but ultimately the, the difficulty that we face is that the workhorse for credit assignment, for temporal credit assignment in recurrent neural networks right now is backpropagation through time. And uh, the, the trouble is that backprop, is, backprop through time is not biologically plausible, and I'll tell you why today. Um, but to do that, I'm gonna give you an overview of it. And I'll also talk about a related solution called real-time recurrent learning, which is a little bit more biologically plausible, but also still arguably not sufficiently plausible for that to be something that the brain actually does. Okay, so let's start with the question of temporal credit assignment. So I wanna start with the definition of credit assignment because there can be a lot of confusion around this term. And I certainly find that when I have discussions with people on Twitter and in person, um, there's often like a lack of clarity on, on what's meant by this. So I'm going to do my best to clarify it. So when we talk about credit assignment, what we're talking about is the following question. How do you determine which changes should be made to a neural network in order to guarantee that you will be better at some tasks? And you know, another way of putting this is which synapses, if, if you're doing your learning via synaptic plasticity, but that's another thing we can discuss today, whether that's really the right thing to do. But if you're doing your learning via synaptic plasticity, really what you're asking is which synapses are responsible for any errors you're making. And I highlight this question of um, the, this, this guarantee thing here, precisely because I think that this is sometimes what people get confused by. So there are of course many different learning algorithms that we can generate for neural networks, which lead to interesting behaviors, which when you implement them in a simulation, you get fascinating self-organizing maps, you get interesting receptive fields, interesting patterns, all this is really cool stuff. But at the end of the day, 
many of the algorithms that do neat things and lead to interesting phenomena in simulation don't actually provide a guarantee that the network will get better at some task. So to, to put that mathematically, if we have a loss function that defines how we're doing at some task, so some function that is a metric for you are this bad at some task, and we want to reduce that loss function over time, what we want is something that provides a guarantee that if we update our synaptic weights by delta w, then at least in expectation, the loss function following the uh, update to the weights will be less than the loss function was prior to the update to the weights. I put this in expectation because in many algorithms, including stochastic gradient descent, you're not always guaranteed that, that, is, that, that, that it's going to be true for the actual updates itself, but you have a guarantee in expectation. And furthermore, I, th I think it's important to highlight that because one of the things we can say is that some learning algorithms have what we call weak credit assignment and some have what we call strong credit assignment, depending essentially on what the bias and the variance of these expectations are. So if you are pretty much guaranteed to almost always be reducing your loss function, we'd call that strong credit assignment. If, however, it takes many, many, many synaptic updates, to see a reduction in that, uh, in that loss function, we'd call it weak credit assignment. But if at least there's some guarantee that in expectation your loss is going down, that is credit assignment. So this is what we're after. Now, um, the most straightforward manner of doing credit assignment is gradient descent. I say stochastic gradient descent here, but really true gradient descent is the, the most straightforward manner. And um, as many of you watching will know, I'll just review it just in case there's anyone who's not 100% sure. The basic idea behind gradient descent is, is fairly simple. If we have that loss function that measures how poorly we're doing at our task, so you know, higher loss means worse at the task, you can think of that loss function as a, as a landscape in synaptic weight space. So for every setting of your synapses, there is some amount of loss that you get, some crappiness at the task that you have. And Gradient descent just says, calculate what the slope of this loss function is in synaptic space and follow the steepest direction of that slope. And it's, um, as I said, a straightforward manner to do credit assignment because you are obviously, you receive that guarantee very clearly. If you're always going downhill on your loss function, you're guaranteed that the updates to the weights you're making will always take you to a lower point in the loss function. There, of course, can be uh, minima that you might reach, but you're never going to raise your loss function with gradient descent. Now, um, to, to do this in a recurrent neural network, uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to think about how past activity influenced present activity. So when we have a recurrent neural network, um, say here's an illustration of a recurrent neural network with an input x and output y and two hidden units that I'll call h1 and h2. Um, we can think of this recurrent neural network rolled out through time like this. So here we have um, indices of time at the bottom. So time step zero, time step one, time step two, etc. And when we're doing credit assignment, part of what we're asking is effectively, how did activity in the past influence the errors that we got at the end? And the reason that's what you're asking is because in order to figure out which synapse you have to change to, up, to reduce your loss function, you need to know how the synapses guided activity throughout the entirety of, your, of the time. And that's what we're going to look at right now, um, how backprop through time solves that and why that solution is biologically implausible. Um, so, you know, because it can go through weird paths, right? It could be that the way that the inputs activated neuron one here at time step zero was key to the activation of neuron two at the subsequent time steps that then led to the error. And if you just look at, oh, what caused the error at the end, your answer will be, well, it's neuron two, and so therefore you should be updating the synapses to neuron two. But in fact, it was something about the way that neuron one interacted with neuron two way back in time. And these are the sorts of things that backprop through time can figure out for you in which not all learning algorithms can. Okay, so let's, let's get into backprop through time. So, so backpropagation of error, of course, is, um, one way to do gradient descent. I think this is important to clarify. Gradient descent is a general class uh, of algorithms and backprop is a specific way of implementing gradient descent. And 
backprop just says, um, so if you think about it for a feed forward network for a moment where you have some input and then a series of layers of neurons and an output, um, backprop basically just says calculate your gradients recursively by communicating errors backwards through the layers of your network. Um, hence the name backpropagation of error. Uh, and you can do this in a recurrent neural network in a very simple way. If you have a recurrent neural network here, we've got one, this is from the original uh, backprop paper uh, from the 80s. Uh, if you have two, uh, net, two neurons here in a recurrent neural network and you unroll them through time, you can now think of this unrolled neural network as a feed forward neural network. And so you can apply the same principles of backpropagation of error to this unrolled neural network, and that will give you your credit assignment. Now, um, let's actually look at, uh, at how this works um, in, in practice. So let's assume that we're rolling out some neural network from time t equals zero to time t, capital T, and then we're going to get some error at time capital T. So the way that we're going to update our weights is we're going to calculate here, I'm just, I'm writing it as partials, uh, but at this point in time, these are still vectors. So these are gradients really. Um, anyway, so, so we've got our, our weight update here and it is uh, ultimately the, the um, gradient of the error with respect to our weights. But what that's gonna be is that's gonna be the sum across all the time steps of how the error depended on the hidden unit activity at that time step and then how the hidden unit activity at that time step depended on the weights. And you've got to do this across all of your time steps. So that in and of itself is, is a potentially slightly difficult thing, but where backprop through time gets particularly tricky is this term here, the, the derivative of the error with respect to the hidden units uh, at, at times t, because um, what that's going to require is calculations backwards through time that are biologically implausible, as we'll see in a moment. So here, let's look at our, uh, the neural network example I gave a, a moment ago again. Um, so we've got uh, basically this neural network with inputs x, outputs y, hidden units h1 and h2. And we're going to roll this out over three time steps. So this is a very simple example even, like we're not getting into anything even a little bit complicated. And we've got to calculate these values for this neural network after we get the error at time step two. So as I mentioned, this term is the tricky one. So the derivative of the uh, error with respect to the hidden unit activity at some time step t. And one of the reasons is, so, so let's, let's chain this out. So we use the chain rule. We get the derivative of the error with respect to the hidden unit activity at the time step that the error was received. So that's nice. This is probably a relatively easy thing to calculate because you're basically just asking, what was the neuron doing when we got the error? But then the second term is the tricky one. This is how did the activity of the neurons at time step t, capital T, depend on the activity of the neurons at time step small, small t? And um, this is that question of how the neurons activity influenced each other over time. And it's what you've got to calculate to do full gradient descent in, in a recurrent neural network. And this is, this is where things get really biologically tricky. So let's, let's see why. So this value is ultimately a product of matrices um, where what we have is for each time step backwards through time from L equals T minus one to lowercase t, we're asking how did the activity of a, of a the neuron at time step L plus one, how was it influenced by the activity of the neurons at time step L? And if you have a relatively simple neural network, this, this of course doesn't hold necessarily for a complex biological neuron, but that's another discussion. If you have a relatively simple neural network um, of the sort that does a linear uh, summation followed by some nonlinear activation function, then what you're gonna get here is um, these are the derivatives. So by H prime, I'm indicating the derivative of the activation function with respect to the linear input to the neuron. So you're gonna get a diagonal matrix of the derivatives of these activation functions uh, multiplied by the recurrent weight matrix here, WR. Um, and this product of matrices is what you need to do, your, to do your update. So we're running a recursive set of matrix multiplications backwards through time. And this is, this is where things get kind of bonkers from a biological finding. 
Now, before I, I really dive into why it's biologically bonkers, I just want to touch briefly on the following. So why are we even talking about this? Many people might be like, well, okay, so credit assignment sounds nice, but um, Backprop Through Time was invented for artificial neural networks. It's used in AI. Why would we even start to think that the brain might do this? So I think it's worth noting that a consistent empirical finding over the last decade is that the efficacy of gradient descent algorithms, which includes backpropagation through time, tends to increase with bigger networks. And this is in, in part due to the fact that the properties of Heidi landscapes are actually really nice for gradient descent. And I don't have time to go through what those properties are, but it has to do with the smoothness, the, the, the lack of local minima, all these other things. And so what you see with backprop through time and other gradient descent algorithms is that they scale up really well. If you increase the amount of compute that you devote to your neural network, the learning tends to get better. And that's not something you see for all learning algorithms. Um, in fact, for some learning algorithms, it's the exact opposite. For example, node perturbation, which is where you do random jitters of the activity, and then you reward jitters that helped um, your, reduce your loss function, uh, node perturbation gets worse the larger the network is. And, and there are other algorithms with that same property. So backprop has this nice, nice property that the larger your network is, the, the better it is. And um, so if you had billions of neurons in your brain, as, as many kind of higher order mammals do, um, you might want something like gradient descent because you would arguably be much better at learning as a result of using an algorithm that actually gets better the bigger your brain is. Uh, and I think it's also worth saying, uh, so for the record, I, I noticed that uh, Ilya made this same comment on, on Twitter uh, a few hours ago, so I, I shared it there. And, you know, so I'm not the only nutcase who thinks this is a reasonable argument for why we should consider at least alternative, like something like backprop in the brain, even though the brain can't do backprop itself. The, the other thing that I think is worth noting, and this I just mentioned because it'll come up in the, in the next talk, is this question of, um, you know, alternative algorithms. There, there are, of course, many learning algorithms that have been invented for recurrent neural networks. But I think it's worth noting that it's not yet clear that any of the alternatives scale up to really big networks and really hard problems. They might. This is an un, unsolved question. But you know, we know that if you take backprop and you apply it to ever bigger neural networks, the neural networks just kind of get better at stuff. Like, so for this image is from uh, Defense of the Ancients to Dota 2. And you know, we're now at the point where you can you know, OpenAI uh, last year showed that they can beat the world champion in Dota 2 with um, uh, agents trained with gradient descent um, on this game. Uh, and no one's ever shown anything like that for any of the alternative algorithms that exist. Now, does that mean that none of the algorithms could ever do that? No, we don't, we don't know that. But we do know that gradient descent does is successfully solve these problems. So we're in this funny situation now where there's a lot of um, interest in developing alternatives, biologically plausible alternatives to gradient descent, but um, we don't know if any of them would actually scale up to really difficult problems in really big networks. But we do know that backprop can scale up. So let's go back to the, if, if backprop scales up, why not just assume the brain does backprop? So let's talk about why it's biologically implausible. Okay, so let's look at these partials again. So we've got this product of matrices over all time steps from T, capital T minus one to T. And let's actually just look at this visually, first of all, to understand what this product is gonna do for us. So what I've done here is I've unrolled the recurrent neural network over time, and I've color-coded the recurrent synapses. So we've got our blue synapse. This is the um, connection from neuron one to itself, the green synapse, the connection from neuron one to neuron two, et cetera. And when we think about those credit assignment pathways, when we think about how did each neuron influence the other neuron over the course of time, um, effectively we have eight different potential recurrent credit pathways. This is just for a two neuron uh, recurrent neural network. So um, what I've got here is if we think about each of those partials across the two time steps. So here we've got the, um, this term is the, the derivative of the second unit's act 
sorry, the first unit's activity H1 with at time step two with respect to its activity at time step zero. And when we think about the different ways in which the activity of neuron one at time step zero could have influenced the activity of neuron one at time step two, we've got this credit pathway here where it flows through its own autophagic synapse. So blue, blue. Alternatively, the activity could have flown via neuron two. So it could have been that neuron one activated neuron two, which then on the next time step activated neuron one again. And so we get green, red. This is our second credit pathway for this partial. So for each partial, we have two different credit pathways giving us eight different recurrent credit pathways that we need to consider. And backprop through time is effectively a way of covering all of these recurrent pathways and considering the way in which they can impact the error. So to see that, let's roll out our matrix multiplication here. So um, these are actually the matrices that we're multiplying. We've got our color-coded synapses here. So we'll do the first step of the multiplication. And here what you can see is these are our two steps of credit assignment. So this is the red pathway on the second time step. So this is if you're considering this one, the blue is if you're considering this one, etc. And when you multiply these matrices together, you end up getting effectively something that is calculating each of these different eight recurrent pathways. So that's given by this matrix multiplication here. So this first term in the top right corner of our matrix here is all of the credit pathways related to this first partial here. How did neuron one influence itself over time uh, across these two time steps. So we've got our blue blue pathway and our green red pathway. And then the other terms relate to the other potential pathways. So here this this pathway relates to how did neuron two influence neuron two at time step zero influence neuron one at time step two. So we've got via the red blue pathway right there, and then we've got via the black red pathway right there. So each of the terms in this matrix are giving us our credit assignment information via these different pathways. And that's, that's great, that provides a very powerful credit assignment algorithm. It's what allows a good solid guarantee that your loss function is gonna go down over time because you're considering all of the different ways in which the neurons can interact with one, one another. And that's cool, but um, it's important to note a couple of things. The first is that the ordering matters here because you, you need to actually keep track of like, okay, it was this neuron, then this neuron, this neuron, then this neuron. So you can't just mix everything together. It has to be these specific pathways listed here. And what that means is that it, it, it implies that every synapse is keeping an ordered list effectively of who activated who when and, and using this list when the error is finally received. So you're, you know, everyone's keeping an ordered list of who activated who when, um, multiplying and summing it all in just the right way. And then when the error is received, you know, tacking that error on to uh, these various credit assignment pathways in order to do the updates. The, the other reason, aside from just the sheer amount of information that the neurons have to keep track of that this is biologically implausible, is that it also assumes that neurons know the value of synaptic weights they're not connected to. Because if you think about, for example, this pathway here, so we're saying, how did neuron one influence itself uh, across these two time steps? One of the ways it can do it is via neuron two, but to know exactly how that worked, neuron one would have to know something about this connection onto neuron two. And so it means that you have implicitly within these calculations, these non-local interaction terms. So, um, the, uh, the, the, re the reality is that this is just not biologically plausible. Um, put another way, what, what's happening is that the network as a whole needs to record uh, an on order of n to the t plus one distinct values, uh, as well as have non-local knowledge of um, synaptic weights. And our knowledge of neurophysiology suggests this is impossible, especially for big nets and long times. So um, just briefly, uh, there is an alternative to backpropagation through time in order to do gradient descent. As I noted, gradient descent is a class of algorithms. Backprop through time is one way to do it. Another um, thing you can do is called real-time recurrent learning. 
Um, this was introduced by Williams and Zipser in 1989. And the idea here is that you're going to replace those backwards calculations with a recursive forward calculation. Um, and you can do that because you can use the fact that if you look at the derivative of the hidden unit activity at some time step t plus one with respect to the weights, that's actually a function of the derivative of the hidden unit activity at time step t with respect to the weights. And so you can calculate recursively these gradient values from these gradient values. Um, and that means that you don't have to you know, have this big uh, history of all activity that you then use when the error is finally, arri finally arrives. Instead, you can keep this recursive thing going and theoretically you can update on the fly as well. Um, so that reduces the number of values to track and, and as I said, it, it allows for online weight updates because if now technically, if you do online weight updates, it's no longer explicitly gradient descent, but if the weight, if learning rate is sufficiently small, then you're still close enough to the gradient that you have that credit guarantee. Um, the problems is, the problems are that this still requires the network to track a surprisingly large amount of values, specifically it's um, n cubed, n cubed which for you know, a network with a million neurons, that's maybe a problem to assume that neurons can track that many values. Um, furthermore, it still assumes that neurons know about the value of synaptic weights that they're not actually connected to. Because if you, if you look at this equation, um, here we've got neuron K. Neuron K needs to know things about weights for other neurons that, that, that it has no access to. So um, it's still not a local learning rule either, in addition to the fact that you're still keeping track of a fairly large number of terms over time. So to summarize, because uh, I got my five minute warning a couple of minutes ago, um, the situation that we're in right now is that we know from work in machine learning that credit assignment is useful for training recurrent neural networks. We, we can do things with recurrent neural networks that um, we, when, we, when we train them with backpropagation through time or gradient descent or related, any, any kind of gradient descent algorithm, we can do things with recurrent neural networks that we find difficult to do with other learning algorithms. And at least to date, no one has demonstrated that any biologically plausible learning algorithm can scale up in the way that backpropagation through time. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, so, so we're in this funny situation where we know backprop through time is a great solution on some level, um, but as well as, you know, related algorithms like real-time recurrent learning, but they're not biologically plausible. So, um, you know, I think the, the situation that we face is the following question, because often I think people get confused about this. When, when people like me talk about this problem, I don't think that the brain's doing backprop through time. Um, you know, Tim Lillycrap, Jeff Hinton, et cetera, none of us have argued this necessarily. But the point is that maybe the brain does need a way of solving the credit assignment problem robustly, efficiently, like I said, having a strict guarantee that that loss function reduces over time. And, and to do so, maybe it needs an alternative way of calculating some of those credit assignment pathways over time, like backprop through time does but in a manner that is hopefully more biologically plausible and, and not, not so wacky. Um, and I think the, the big research question that we face is, can we um, develop alternatives that are biologically plausible and which scale up well? And that's where we're gonna be going um, in the next presentation. And in the discussion, um, this will be part of the discussion today, but the other part of the discussion is some people think that in fact, this credit assignment thing I've said, talked about is maybe not as much of a problem as I've made it out to be here. And we can discuss that. So um, that's that, thank you very much. I will now try to um, answer some of the questions. Let me just see quickly if there's any I wanna do verbally here. Um, so uh, let's see, does backpropagation through time result in ANNs that mimic the recurrent properties of biological networks beyond task performance. No, like if you just apply it to a bog standard recurrent neural network, I mean, some of the features can come out, but others not. There's, there's a lot of potential differences that can exist. Um, yeah, so I wanted to touch on this one, Laura Medya Vila's um, uh, question. Um, so 
let's just say for a second that I was right, that the brain has some way of solving credit assignment as efficiently as back prop through time does, or with some kind of, um, you know, uh, like sophisticated credit assignment algorithm. Um, the answer would be that, yeah, bigger brains would, would generally be, be better. And it would imply that potentially if say elephants had a similar learning algorithm to us and it was of this class, then maybe elephants are actually smarter than us. <laughs> I'm not actually convinced they're not. I, I think um, the differences between our intelligence and elephant intelligence might have a lot to do with hands and the way that culture gets passed over generations as opposed to specific individual intelligence. But um, I think I should hand it over now. And so um, thank you very much. I'll an continue to answer some questions um, in the text box, uh, but uh, now I'll hand it over um, to Ruri and Gang on uh, the question of what are those alternatives that I mentioned? And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Blake. That was uh, really clear. Um, and now, Rui, would you like to uh, take us to the end of this first section? Yes, I will try to. Um, can you see my slides and my cursor as well? OK, good. Uh, so before I start, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the help I had from Ellen and Joe in preparing these slides. Um, OK, so let's get started. So uh, Katrina and Blake provide a very good, I think, clear overview of biological evidence on one hand and uh, efficient learning in our hands on the other hand, using backdrop through time and or real-time recurrent learning. Um, so I think those those two first uh, parts of the workshop provide a very nice introduction to elements that I'm going to touch on and, and hopefully that's going to become clear. Um, but I should quickly say that <clears throat> I cannot possibly provide a uh, full overview of the RNN field in 15 minutes. So I'm, I'll try my best and provide you with an overview, but uh, please don't expect too much. Uh, I'll focus on two aspects. So the first one is alternative RNNs, in particular reservoir computing and what I'm calling reservoir computing plus, so the more recent versions of reservoir computing and gated recurrent neural networks. And I'll finish by giving you an overview of alternatives to backpropagation through time um, in terms of the eligibility traces and different flavors of eligibility traces. So what's reservoir computing? Uh, the idea here is inspired on the, on the reservoir, uh, on a liquid, uh, where you, if you drop uh, something on this liquid, you see this ripple effect, uh, which in turn gives you a fading memory. So reservoir computing builds on this idea or is inspired by, by this observation uh, where you have a liquid, which is essentially a, a, a recurrent network randomly connected with fixed weights. Uh, that liquid gets some input. This then is projected onto a readout, uh, onto a linear readout uh, to uh, produce some output. So here you are trying to exploit the high dimensionality of that liquid, as well as the dynamics uh, typically chaotic dynamics that you, you have in this uh, recurrently connected network. Uh, so as I just mentioned, there's two key properties. So the fading memory, which in turn gives you interesting dynamics and useful dynamics, as well as the input separability, which comes about through this uh, 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 dimensionality expansion um, from, from where it will, be easier, it will become easier to read uh, something out. Uh, it typically, or was originally uh, proposed as a, as a rate uh, model, uh, but there's spiking versions as well. So you have the echo state networks, which are rate based, uh, or the liquid state machines, which are um, uh, spike based. And the, the network, the recurrent network is, uh, is randomly connected with fixed weights. And importantly for our discussion today, the plasticity typically only occurs uh, at the level of the readout. Um, so it's a very relatively simple uh, plasticity mechanism uh, where you typically apply a least squares method. Um, I should highlight here though that in, in the, the standard reservoir computing, you need to uh, clamp your target during training. So there's still some subtle issues that are important for our discussion. So it's still not trivial to argue that they are biologically plausible. 
Um, in general, then you can use this reservoir as a, as a backbone for multiple tasks. It's just a, a pool of dynamics that you can exploit for different tasks with different readouts. So that's a nice property to have. So just to give you an example, here you have a, um, um, a reservoir, which, uh, which, which receives this input as a step-like step input. And you can see that different neurons develop different, slightly different dynamics. So then you can use a readout to extract and read from those dynamics and build a more complex signal. Um, so just to give you a specific example, here uh, is an example of a network that was trained given this input, this step uh, function as input, was trained to produce a wave, a form of, a specific, of, of specific frequencies. Um, so the network output is in gray um, and the actual target is just behind it in black. Um, so you can see that after training does a, a good job, uh, but it's still not perfect. And there's often a, a phase, a phase lag um, that these methods uh, exhibit. And also note that as you the further you go into the future, the, the, the ability to capture the underlying target becomes worse and worse. So to summarize, uh, reservoir computing uh, relies on reservoir dynamics, performs some, fun, some form of credit assignment by doing least squares on the output. Uh, its strengths are the fact that uh, because it relies on least squares just on the output, its training is relatively fast, can be super fast. Um, and therefore, it may, we can argue, or it's possible to argue that it's biologically plausible, uh, with the caveat that uh, you need this target clamping uh, during training. In terms of weaknesses, uh, you could argue that there's no uh, learning in the recurrent synapses. And I think there's strong biological support for that. Uh, and this completely ne neglects that. And in terms of performance or generalization properties, it's not the best method that there is. Okay, so going on to what I'm calling reservoir computing plus. Um, so I'm going to start with forced learning, which builds on ideas from uh, reservoir computing. So again, here we have a rate-based model, uh, although there's recent spiking versions as well. Uh, so we have here a, a network, recurrently connected, uh, randomly connected, very similar to before. Um, again, with a linear readout, the, uh, which then projects to, as with a feedback to, to the main uh, recurrent network. So it's very similar so far we, uh, with the reservoir computing. There is one important difference though. So the, the difference here is that this feedback signal uh, is the output itself. Whereas in reservoir computing, you clamp your target uh, for this uh, feedback signal. Here you use the output itself. So it makes it more plausible and more elegant uh, because there's no uh, kind of switching uh, on and off the target signal during learning compared to after learning. Um, um, on, on, but because of that, you need uh, to keep the error signal. So the error that generates this network generates when you're trying to predict some targets. Uh, so there will be a function will be equal to uh, the weights. So the output weights times the, the activity of the pool R minus some targets. So you need to keep this error relatively small all the time for, for this method to work. And, and for that reason, it relies on uh, relatively complex learning algorithms such as recursive uh, least squares. So it's no longer just uh, least squares, but here there's a, you know, a, a more complex element to it. So it's more plausible because the, the feedback signal is um, simpler to, to, to argue for biologically, but um, the, the, the way you train it is on, on the other hand, uh, uh, more complex. Um, another proposal uh, is called this, uh, is called the self-organized recurrent network or SORN for short. And here we bring in an extra element from biology. So we have, uh, an explicit separation between excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons as uh, Scatrin alluded, alluded to in the beginning. Um, so we are obeying Dale's law. We, are, we use a spiking network. And importantly, we allow for the reservoir to be plastic. In particular, we use STDP, spike timing, timing dependent plasticity between excitatory uh, cells. 
and two forms of homeostatic plasticity. Note though that there's no plasticity inhibitory uh, connections. And th this, uh, so they showed in the paper that this network does some interesting work, can, can learn some interesting tasks. I'm not sure how far they pushed it uh, since then, but uh, you know, back then was you know interesting observation that this network with these properties that are biologically plausible can indeed perform uh, interesting uh, tasks. This then leads me to onto the networks that explicitly change inhibitory connections. Um, so again, here, sorry for the change of colors. There's, 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 there isn't a consensus on which colors to use for excitation inhibition, it seems, in the field. Maybe we should work on that. Um, so here we have excitation and inhibition again, but importantly, inhibition is plastic. Um, so, and, and on top of that, inhibition is typically designed to help stabilize the, the network. So the, so the dynamics, the firing rates in, in, the, in the network. So that, just to give you a quick example on that, uh, if you, without ISP, so without inhibitory synaptic plasticity, or this form of inhibitory synaptic plasticity, at least, you have very easily unstable uh, dynamics. So that, so consider, uh, look at the range of firing rates here, so from zero to 100 hertz. So you can quickly in the network with ISP, without the ISP, uh, go from zero hertz to 100 hertz. So it's cl clearly unstable. But if you bring in ISP, in the right way, uh, you can quick uh, you can uh, stabilize your your dynamics. So now we have, on average, uh, a firing rate of five hertz, which is much more plausible. And of course, as we did in in reservoir computing, in such a framework, you can read out this pool of interesting dynamics that arise uh, to uh, do some uh, interesting tasks. For example, in this case, they they asked it to draw a snake and a butterfly by using the activities of the, of the, of the population. So to summarize this uh, reservoir computing plus, it still relies on reservoir dynamics to some extent. Uh, the credit assignment is also done uh, in terms of least squares, uh, although some methods require more advanced methods um, like in forced learning. Some variants do use recurrent learning, so they do change the recurrent synapses, um, which in turn is, is a plus in terms of biological plausibility. Um, uh, and it's also a plus the fact that it, some of these networks provide you stability. You know, that's a good feature, an important feature to, to keep in mind that we, we often, or people in machine learning, maybe often ignore or don't pay so much attention to. Uh, in terms of weaknesses, um, you can argue that biological plausibility can be a plus or a minus. Uh, so the fact that you need now maybe less trivial learning in some of these settings maybe makes it less plausible. And again, the, the, the powerful, the, the performance you can get or the tasks you can solve with these methods are maybe not uh, uh, the same as, as we, you can do with the recreation through time. So that then leads me on to gated recurrent neural networks which are one of the most used recurrent networks in, in machine learning. Uh, I'm uh, illustrating here the classical example that people use in machine learning, where there's two key elements. So a memory cell, which allows you to, to integrate uh, previous inputs, and a gate. So the idea is that the input arrives, passes through some nonlinearity, and then it's gated by, in this case, the input gate. So this input gate is controlling the flow of information onto the memory cell. Uh, so these two elements together, this memory cell together with these, these gates uh, are the kind of the key ingredients of these networks. There's some, some, more, some other subtle aspects, but these are the, the key properties. Um, one of the interesting um, observations, observations that I think has been made, although maybe not explicitly in the field, is that when you then use these networks, you, you can relax uh, back propagation through time meaning that you can use truncated backpropagation through time. So you can truncate how far back into the past you go um, and you still do relatively well. Well, you know, uh, you know it's, it are the best methods that we have. Um, 
in, in, in particular, you can sometimes go to truncation of two time steps and still you know, get a good, you know, relatively good performance in, in many tasks. To me, this suggests that there's some intrinsic properties in these networks that allow you to, to maybe propagate some infor useful, useful information forward in time to, to perform credit assignment. Uh, then you could argue that maybe these um, networks are not plausible, the architectures of these networks are not plausible. Uh, but I think it's possible to argue that some of these features are indeed consistent with biology. So in particular, we can argue that these gates are implemented by interneurons, um, uh, and these memory cells are implemented by We just you often Rui. find. Rui, you're back. Okay, sorry, we lost. I lost you for a second. So, so did I. Maybe just repeat what you said a moment ago, Rui. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so, so I was saying that you could uh, maybe as, um, say that these networks are not really plausible biologically. Um, and, and, and there I would say that maybe that's not necessarily the case because you can interpret this gating mechanism as being provided by uh, local interneurons. Um, and the memory cell being implemented by recurrently connected excitatory cells. Um, so, so those two principles are, we know they exist in, in biology to some extent. Uh, one of the differences my, with biology might be the fact that these networks typically only rely on, on multiplicative gating, whereas in biology, we know that subtractive gating also exists. Uh, so, so there's this difference here, uh, and, and that's actually, actually something we are exploring at the moment and trying to understand what this is by, uh, you know, why sometime, whether sometimes the brain decide to use multiplicative gating, whereas other times it decides to go with subtractive gating. Um, so just a quick comparison I found the other day uh, I think there's something is missing in the field is a proper comparison between all these methods. Um, and I found this paper that does a, a, a part of it uh, where, so they used uh, some tasks. One of them was uh, trying to capture the dynamics from a Lorentz 96 chaotic model with these different methods. And, and they nicely illustrate some of the points I was trying to make here. So the first one is that reservoir computing is indeed very quick to train. So here on the X axis, we're showing training time, whereas on the Y axis, we're showing accuracy. You see that a reservoir computing straight away does, you know, a relatively good job. Of course, then if you wait, if you allow it to wait for longer, you, you see that LSTMs, uh, which you rely on, on uh, this multiplicative gating, as, as well as GROs, which are two very popular machine learning gated recur networks, they start doing better and better, completely outperforming reservoir computing. Uh, so, so as a summary for, for getting our lens, they, they rely on the network dynamics for the temporal integration. Uh, the credit assignment is done by a truncated by propagation through time. Uh, they, are, they have very good generalization uh, and can do well with weak uh, by propagation through time. Um, uh, the problem though is the biological plausibility. You could argue the, the, the architectures themselves are plausible or somewhat plausible, uh, but the learning might not be um, as possible or not, 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 is not as possible as, uh, as Blake just um, explained. So now I'm going to move on to the second part where I'm going to talk about alternatives to propagation through time more explicitly in the last five minutes or so. Um, as, as Kata uh, nicely introduced in the, in the beginning, one of the popular frameworks in in computational neuroscience is uh, so-called the three-factor learning rules, uh, which rely on, on the use of eligibility traces. So here we have a, a short description of that. So you have a, your delta W, so changes in the weight being equal to a G, which is going to be a, a kind of global, typically global factor, for example, reward signal provided by dopamine and uh, a function of pre and postsynaptic activity H, which is going to encode your typical avian learning. So it's three factors, presynaptic activity, postsynaptic activity, and a modulatory signal, which can be, for example, dopamine. Uh, a specific example is reward modulated STDP, where the, the first two factors are given by the STDP kernel, which is then 
pass through an eligibility trace. So this eligibility trace keeps a memory of potential previous delta uh, Ws. Then you need a global signal, a global teaching signal, like a reward to gate uh, these potential changes. So if you have this global signal, signal times eligibility trace, then you have your, you know, you can change your weights. And this is maybe the, one of the best uh, frameworks that there is in terms of biological plausibility. I think most people will agree that this is biologically plausible. Um, but on the other hand, we have a more recent proposal, uh, which I'm calling here eligibility traces 2.0, uh, which has been uh, coined as EPROP uh, by Bellick et al. It's a very recent proposal, uh, and I think a very elegant one, where we're trying to directly address uh, the question of how the brain might be doing backpropagation through time. So remember, backpropagation through time relies on starting from a cost function or a error function, uh, and from there, backpropagate the error single across back in time, so effectively unfolding your network in time, uh, which is, uh, as Blake nicely illustrated, is highly implausible. Instead, what they propose here is to use eligibility traces to bring that information forward in time. So completely uh, getting uh, away from, from the need to, to use backpropagation through time. Uh, and in particular, what, what the observation they made was that when you write down the derivatives, the derivatives from your error function with respect to weights, uh, you end up with a local time. So your final time is, is local because you're just doing local in time and, and uh, in, in, in space because you're just doing the derivatives from the, the neuron that local neuron with respect to its own internal, uh, its own incoming synapses, doubly. And this term, uh, it's what they define as being the eligibility trace. And that's a term that's going to keep accumulating information about its input uh, and bringing information from the past uh, forward in time. So then you can basically multiply that eligibility trace by some teaching signal and you end up with something that approximates uh, back propagation through time. Just to give you the, the quick flavor without getting into the details. Uh, just to give you a quick example of, you know, well, uh, this, this approach does. Uh, here, they, they did a sound recognition task where they compare back propagation through time with EPROP and some global, like standard three factor learning rule, some more global form of learning. Um, well, the, the nice thing to note first is that this global learning does much worse than, than these two other forms, right? So, so I think it's a nice, it's nice to see. You often say this, but we, we rarely show it and they actually showed it here. So it's nice to see that if you indeed use efficient credit assignments, you can do much better. Uh, so EPROP uh, does uh, more or less the same as spec propagation for time. Uh, so the, the final summary then is that you have these two forms of learning, which both rely on eligibility traces. One relies on the global teaching signal, whereas the other one relies on approximation, an approximation of, of preoccupation through time. Uh, the first one is biologically plausible and is easy to argue for. Uh, uh, the second one gives you good performance. Uh, the, and the weaknesses are that the first one relies on the global signal, which in turn doesn't give you good performance. Um, and the, the, I guess the weaknesses of the second one is the fact that you need very specific eligibility traces, um, which in turn depend on the, on, the, on the neural model that you're using. So, you know, they're still open to, to debate on, on whether there is evidence for, to support this model. So in conclusion, alternative approaches can outperform back propagation through time in some cases, in particular, if you consider uh, uh, training efficiency, like in the case of uh, reservoir, uh, computing. Uh, gated RNNs reduce the need for strong backpropagation through time. I think that's a, a, an interesting observation to, to be made. Uh, eligibility traces offers you a promising framework forward. Uh, and overall, with these methods, we get better, or with some of these better methods, we get better biological plausibility compared to backpropagation through time, but many questions remain open. So I think I don't think at this stage we can say as a clear winner. So and with that, I would like to end, and I can take some questions. Thank you, Rui. Um, I 
don't know uh, if you'd like to take a look through the questions and see if there are any that we want to answer before uh, our break. I was busily answering some via text, but maybe Rudy, if you look at some of the answered ones, there might be others that you'd like to address. So I think I think I think a good question came from uh, Guillaume Lejoie, uh, uh, where he says uh, one key missing ingredient from the presented back propagation through time was the presence of ongoing input terms. Uh, neural networks typically receive receive ongoing inputs from other networks or sensory afferents. Uh, and such signals can affect gradients and many uh, may influence gradient estimates. So could a better understanding of these non-autonomous terms and their roles in the brain be key for biological plausibility? Um, so by non-autonomous terms, you mean, what do you mean exactly? Uh, so so perhaps, perhaps like if, you, if, uh, if Guillaume's still in the audience, uh, you could unmute him and he could, he could clarify. Uh, Eric, can you see Guillaume in the audience? Yeah, so I think I've just unmuted him so he can talk. He's raised okay. his hand, yep. Okay, hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, great. No video, but I have the sound. This is awesome because I look uh, not quite presentable at the moment. So what I was going to say is um, these non-autonomous term as in afferent signals that affect dynamics. So if you think of an RNN, that performs, say, an NLP task, if we're just taking the AI perspective, there are inputs at each time steps that influence the task you're trying to do. Actually, they're part of it. And the brain ultimately receives, you know, like there's an ongoing flow of information. And I think inputs from other parts of the brain, sensory afferent, are part of this whole credit assignment scheme. And I was, you know, replying to, to Blake's um, reply to my question on there. And an important part of the puzzle, I think, is the interaction with like other networks in the brain that might be uh, uh, associated with memory uh, and how these might play an important role to do some credit assignment over long time steps without going through the recurrent paths of the gradient through like the, uh, the back propagation through time. So I think, it, you know, I, I don't have, an, you know, this is just a question, right? Like, but um, I think understanding how the interactions among networks without typically looking at them as an end-to-end -end learning machine, right? That uh, might be important yeah. uh, to understand biological yeah. possibilities. Yeah, no, you, you bring up a very good point. Like, and that's something I wanted to touch on, but uh, I didn't have time to. Um, so I think, at least to me, it's becoming more clear that we have to think more seriously about the role of different brain areas and how they can interact with one another. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, one example to me is the role of hippocampus. So the, I think there's growing evidence to say that hippocampus acts as a predicting system, uh, so a predictive machine uh, for, for kind of long-term planning, for, for planning in general. And, you know, that, that to me suggests that it can play indeed a very important role in credit assignment because it can provide you this kind of long-term window over which to look at uh, without, you know, the need to, to do, you know, back propagation through time, right? So, um, yeah, so I think it's a very important point, and that's something that maybe typically we ignore in the field is the, the interaction between different brain areas and the role they might play. And I think it's going to be, become more important, and, and I think that's something people are paying attention to, and, and I think research is going in, in that direction. I know, Blake, you want to add something? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think definitely thinking about the way that other circuits could be doing these calculations um, is something that we can and should consider and would be one of the potential ways to provide an alternative solution. I guess the question is how much those circuits would have to know about the internal recurrent connectivity to give you a full solution to the credit assignment problem through time um, to have it be really viable. Are there any pressing questions or what, what, what do you think? Should we move on or? I think it's a uh, time probably for the break because then we can follow up in the, the next yeah. section. I think that, so, that, that was uh, great, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rui and uh, Luke. You have uh, something for us. Sure, so, so at, the, at the beginning of the talk, at the beginning of the workshop, um, I shared a poll with the people who were there at the beginning. Uh, I'd, li I'd like everyone who's uh, who, who arrived a bit later to, to respond and maybe, maybe people who hadn't made up their minds uh, or you know, came in quite agnostic to, to kind of give their give their initial impressions on where they sort of stand on these on these positions that we're gonna we're gonna you know start start the discussion with after the break. 
Um, so if I show you uh, if, I, if you go to uh, menti.com um, and uh, type in that code 632508, um, you should see these questions come up. Um, and I'll be displaying the uh, during the break for the next five minutes. You can go up and get water and, and do what you need to do. Um, but if, yeah, if you if you respond to these, you should be able to see these update in real time. Uh, so there's there's questions on one page and then on the next page too. Uh, so yeah, see you all back in five minutes. And uh, if you've got a moment, please ask these questions. Great. So see you in five minutes, and uh, we'll begin again. So um, we're going to start again in a minute. Um, anybody who's gone for a drink, hopefully you'll join us in a second. Sure. So let's yeah let's let's get on with the panel discussion. Like we 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 ask you these questions as a, as a way to gauge uh, sort of audience interest in 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 you know how, how to how to approach this discussion. Um, so kind of the, the the first the first sort of set of questions that prepared uh, we're, we're, on, we're on this views of, of, of temporal credit assignment so it seems like there's there's quite broad agreement um, over over audience members thinking that it's important for the brain and, and that there exist biological mechanisms for estimating gradients through time like there, there is there are a few people with some very strong disagreement with this which um, would be interesting to hear about uh, but there does seem to be a bit, a bit uh, you know a lot more variability in, in uh, how like the, the actual biological implement, implementation of, uh, of gradient estimation. Um, whether you know this can be something that is estimated locally amongst individual neurons, or something that requires uh, population activity to estimate um, uh, over, over large populations of neurons, um, and so then, and then yeah, also another another part which has come up in the in the Q and A a fair bit is is you know how, how important is plasticity throughout life? Um, you know, is 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 plasticity as important during childhood as it is during adulthood, um, and how important are evolution pre-wired circuits? So. I think we're now going to invite uh, we're now going to invite two additional speakers: Christina Sabin from uh, New York University, and Wolfgang Maas from Graz, uh, from the Graz University University of uh, sorry the Graz University uh, Technology Graz University of Technology. Um, so, so have we got everyone back? Have we got Rui Rui back, and we've got Blake back? I think we're just waiting on Rui. Okay, well. Um, in which case, uh, perhaps, 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 while, well, perhaps while, while he's away, we'll answer the very important question of uh, whether excitatory synapses should be labelled in red and inhibitory in blue, or if there's <laughs> yes. other disagreement about that. Unless you're colorblind, case in which maybe I should come up with else. Yeah, so th these are the important questions we can definitely resolve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, Do you think we can to... resolve this question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's 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 start with an easy one then. Um, so, I think I think we all agree. Well, amongst the panelists, um, how important is it for the brain to explicitly estimate gradients to an objective function through to a, to a, to explicitly estimate gradients to a, an objective function through time? And uh, what kind of objectives do you think would be important to optimize? So uh, I think I'd first like to, to direct that to Christina. What, what do you think? So I think it's sort of like undoubtedly true that the brain is um, interested in understanding temporal statistics or dependence, statistical dependencies over time. They're critical for survival, for prediction. There's ample behavioral evidence that humans and animals are sensitive to this kind of statistical regularities and they respond to them uh, when, when they um, direct actions. What's less clear is what's the form of the loss function that, that is required for, for that behavioral manifestation to happen. Um, so BBPT implicitly <laughs> requires some, some sort of error signal. Um, now this is not, and, and a lot of the statistical learning that, that humans and animals do is, is not explicitly rewarded. So, so there is no immediate reward signal. Um, that's not necessarily a problem because there, there are notions of cost functions that um, so, like that are sort of 
along the lines of self-supervised learning where you're generating cost functions, but training them as, as if it was a, a, a supervised learning problem. Um, so I, I think that it would be nice from a sort of from an experimental or behavioral perspective to actually test the limits of exactly what kind of statistical regularities can humans and animals um, respond to what's the temporal horizons at, at which the statistical regularities are important um, and that, that was sort of like potentially um, give more qualifications with respect to exactly what kind of loss functions um, we need to learn um, okay. um, so, so just following up on that slightly do you think there's uh, an important you know do, do you think there may be uh, particular architectures or algorithms that are implemented by the brain that are particularly good at extracting causal relationships that, that, are, that are sort of predisposed to sort of trying to identify relationships between, between causal relationships between actions and outcomes um, that uh, yeah I, I don't know that necessarily I think it's really hard to define causal relationships in in this context but but I, I do think that sort of like there's there's definitely a predictive aspect of, of the kind of loss functions that we're optimizing for um i would agree with that and i i think that you know one of the questions that tony zador asked in in the q a was what sorts of tasks would you even need you know something like back property time for I think even something like just predicting your next sensory inputs, given your current sensory inputs and your motor commands is potentially a difficult enough task that it would require good credit assignment. Um, so even the most basic, in, in my opinion, even the most basic of sort of sensory motor tuning that occurs in early life might require good credit assignment. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, that there are a lot of things that have an explicit temporal component. So the fact that that you listen to music once and you're able to pick up the rhythm, predict what what um, little um, structure sequence will come next, um, that that's evidence for for that we're doing this sort of learning. Um, but um, it, it probably it has hierarchical structure as well. And I, I haven't seen anybody explore um, but the hierarchical structure um, for, for um, statistical regularities and sequences, that that would be interesting for, from a biological perspective. So it, it looked like uh, Wolfgang had something to, having something to comment on that. Uh, it, would, you, would you also agree or would you sort of say this, that there are more subtleties to it than, than that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I must admit, now I find this exciting discussion, but I also have an uneasy feeling all the time um, if we don't just ask you know, how is spec propagation through time implement the brain, but really ask you know, the fundamental questions of this workshop, which synapses are plastic at any time and dimensionality, then I think we really have to go back and become be more specific. What species are we talking about? What exactly, what type of learning task is association learning? Is episodic memory involved? Is it the skill learning? And I think there's ample biological evidence that all these different types of learning uh, engage different types of synaptic plasticity. And then I think, you know, there's an elephant in the room, which is really kind of what is the result of previous learning or even innate knowledge and innate capabilities, because all this learning takes place on top of this um, in non-human primates or rodents much more than uh, in humans, but even humans, you know, there is you no know, lot of evidence you know, there are innate skills, innate knowledge, and learning builds on top of this, right? So we not only have to answer really how you know, do these recurrent networks in the brain learn, but also how they protect what has already been previously learned or what is innate in there. Uh, so therefore, I think the question of this workshop cannot be separated from this other, another fundamental question, how is so-called continual learning or avoidance of catastrophic forgetting solved in the brain, right? Um, and so therefore we have lots of tasks, but I think it's probably really essential to be specific. Also, you know, as you know, uh, Christine and others suggested, what's the type of loss function? Are we talking about unsupervised learning, supervised learning, reinforcement learning, right? And I think now, we have a tradition in theoretical neuroscience you not know, to abstract them, and this is good at some point, but if we come back to these fundamental questions, we have to 
also ask you know, what is the right level of abstraction where we can answer these questions. Uh, there may not be a uniform answer, which uh, is uh, satisfactory for all these types of issues. So if, if, if we're sort of restricting the, the sort of species question of, of uh, to, to, you know, rodents to, to larger mammals to humans, uh, like kind of getting onto that question of catastrophic forgetting and, and continual learning, like do, do you think the uh, do you think do you think it's 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 simply like or well, not simply a problem, but do you think it's a problem of of finding the correct loss function for uh, preventing catastrophic forgetting? So it's it's something that you know it, it is explicitly encoded into the loss function, or is it something that is uh, you know you, you have a particular set of weights that uh, you know, a particular state of the network that's initialized in a certain way that that keeps it from uh, uh, that, that keeps the parameters in a certain regime. Uh, to prevent catastrophic forgetting in future, uh, or do you think it's 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 a it's an architecture problem? Do you think there are certain architectures that are are better designed at uh, preventing preventing catastrophic forgetting and are more suited to continual learning? I think at least if one looks at the literature and machine learning, you know, there are a number of suggestions for you know, continual learning, uh, models and also recurrent networks. Um, I think they are really you no know, suggest not to look into other directions than just looking at revising loss functions. Uh, they are more architectural issues, um, but also think you know, that probably in the end, you know, the methods that have been proposed in machine learning for solving these problems may not be the right ones for biology. So I think we have to rethink this again. Then, um, and also, you no, know, in some sense, you no, know, I think. A little bit the issue was already, I think, presented implicitly when Katarina will show at the beginning, you know, this SDP curves, you say a number of data points, right? And some data points were right up on the SDP curves we usually see, but some other data points were very close to the x-axis, right? They didn't move then. And possibly they contained valuable information. It was an accident that they did not move, right? And I'm missing models which can capture this biological phenomena. So do, do you have anything to say about that, Rui or Katerina? Do you think um, uh, that, that, there, that there would be a, a benefit to having uh, sort of more fixed recurrent synapses that, that there would be um, uh, one, one, one solution to, to preventing catastrophic forgetting is to, is to, is to say like these, these, are, these are recurrent synapses that are, are crucial for performing particular tasks that we don't want to mess with. No, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say that they are dedicated synapses that are fixed. Um, I mean, uh, you want also robustness of the network. Imagine some cells are dying and then no other cell can take over the function. So I don't think that is the solution. Also, we see a lot of uh, spine turnover, like um, synapses change all the time, even if there's no change in the behavior of the animal. Um, so I don't think it's uh, particular synapses that are relevant. I think it's more um, the population activity or something that counts. and. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, I also uh, pointed out that there's lots of neuro neuromodulation going on, gaining of plasticity, so maybe protection rather happens by um, having by default not too much plasticity going on, but only if something relevant happens that then we want to update the network. Um, yeah. uh, so we, got, we had a we had an interesting contribution from Siri Ganguly here. Um, so one is saying one possibility might be to make synapses um, more computationally powerful. Uh, is is Siri still in the audience? Does he want to sort of elaborate on that point at all? Uh, it, if, if he can raise his hand. Yeah. He's there. Sir, sir, you can talk now. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, it's been, been a lot of fun. Uh, woke up at 6 a.m. for this. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, the yeah, so so I just cited like like one small paper that we did on on intelligence synapses that like uh, you know they can remember the changes that were important for a task and then freeze those changes as you learn new tasks and that helped a little bit. But I, I think there's kind of two directions that might be really interesting to think about. One from the molecular biology of synapses, right? Synapses are way more complicated than uh, just a WIJ, right? And there's kind of two directions we've seen where that complexity is absolutely essential. One is in like uh, memory. So we had a paper in complex synapses back then and, and this other in synaptic intelligence. I don't think we've milked that idea enough. Um, 
The second thing is we might be too seduced by gradient descent and therefore backpropagation. Like if you think about other collective, other systems with collective inter interactions that yield efficient outcomes, for example, like markets and economics, right? There's no sense in which the entire global system is doing gradient descent on a, on a single cost function. You have these, these uh, self-interested agents that, are, that all have their own self-interest and they interact with each other, but somehow the global system, you know, modulo some minor global regulation leads to efficient allocation of resources, right? So maybe economic intelligence and differential games uh, might be something that we're probably all completely missing as a, as a community, uh, myself included, um, just, a, just a thought. This kind of come back somewhat to, to Guillaume's question about you know uh, different different sort of motivations or, or, or different activity across across brain regions. Um, do you think that, that different brain regions would be uh, sort of competing adversarially in some in some ways to, to to ensure that learning was efficient over time? Potentially, I mean, different brain regions do vie for control over behavior uh, in different ways. So, yeah, potentially. I mean. Um, and, and you know, there's very different learning rules in the cerebellum versus basal ganglia versus cortex versus hippocampus. And so if you have these interacting modular systems with different learning rules that are talking to each other, I, I just think that's an area that we haven't really, as a community, sort of wrapped our heads around as well. Again, myself included. Um, to kind of opening up that to, to the panelists again, do you think that there are, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of adversarial um, or sort of com competing competing objectives for different brain regions you think would be useful to consider uh, when 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 thinking about how uh, uh, we're thinking how, how this might be influenced in the brain. So so if I can touch on on one thing on this that I think is an interesting question, I think it's important to distinguish between an adversarial setting where you have multiple cost functions that are interacting in interesting ways and the absence of credit assignment. Because if, you, if we take Surya's market example for a moment, the, the key reason now, we can argue about the actual efficiency of markets, et cetera, but that's not the discussion today. The, the, the key thing, of course, is that, let's say uh, we can assume for the most part that you know, each agent within the market has a means of determining what changes they need to make to themselves in order to get better at their internal specific goal, right? And there can then be a collective sort of emergence of something interesting there. Um, but at the same time, as we've seen with economics, if there is no way of determining across agents how they should work together, if there is no state, things can get bad pretty quickly, in fact. And, and so I actually really like this, this analogy in the same way that I would argue that, you know, for economics, you can't actually just have a pure free market where every agent does their own thing. You need something to occasionally guide the, the, the linkages between the different agents. I suspect the brain would need something like that as well. And, and furthermore, each agent needs an internal credit assignment mechanism. So although I agree with the postulate that there's surely not a single cost function or loss function that's describing everything in the brain, I'm not sure that sidesteps the need to occasionally have systems for determining which synapses were responsible for this, that, or the other behavior that needs to be updated within the circuit. I think that that problem still exists for us to some extent. Yeah, I agree. I wonder whether maybe one should also think about this temporal credit assignment problem in a, one could call it a more naive way because you no, know, we know episodic memory formed even in, in rodents, right? On the one shot, right? So if they try something new, they probably remember for a few seconds what they just tried, right? If they're then successful, it will be part of the same episode in episodic memory, right? So in some sense, also this link between you know, trying something new and the outcome is already formed there, right? We know it in hippocampus and their special plasticity rules like this, BTSB you know, of Bitna et al. then from the McGee lab, which show that you know, there is also a very specific plasticity rule involving uh, dendritic plateau potential, dendritic spikes, which you know, enables this uh, very fast learning, right? So this solves, I think, a number of issues related to temporal credit assignments, all right? So therefore we probably have to ask, you know, what do we need in addition to this then? I think I think Rui wanted to say something uh, 
I, I, I was going. I was going to answer your your question directly. Um, so I, I don't actually think that that's my personal opinion that different brain areas are competing with one another. Uh, I actually think they are helping one another. Uh, so uh, the, the way I think about it is that different brain areas or different uh, subcortical brain areas are helping the, the neocortex to, to perform more efficient credit assignments. So the, I think about the neocortex as a credit assignment machine, and then you have these subcortical regions trying to help it in specific ways. For example, hippocampus could be helping it by providing more kind of long-term planning, uh, or the cerebellum could be helping it by bridging or making smart uh, forward jumps or backward jumps uh, across the network. Um, so uh, I actually think that, you know, there's the, you know, it's all working towards the same goal, which is implement efficient uh, credit assignment. I mean, there is a notion of sort of like different subcircuits of like preferring different time scales. So, so you have a, a diversity of time scales represented at the level of different circuitry. Um, I, I don't know that we know necessarily. I, I agree that 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 doesn't necessarily mean competition between them, um, mm -hmm. and they they could support one another. And and the systems level consolidation that Wolfgang was talking about is a no notion in which one faster learning um, system could. Um, consolidate information in a slower um, evolving system. Um, but yeah, I also don't think that there's a, that there's a lot of experimental support of your hypothesis that, that they're, they're all supporting one another directly for the purposes of, of temporal credit assignment or, or spatial temporal learning. Um, so it's I could, I could, I could dispute that, but you know, I don't think <laughs> I could try to. Mm. But that's my own, that's my own intuition. Let, so, let's yeah. touch on this though, because I think one of the things we have learned, you know, um, uh, Wolfgang mentioned uh, Jeff McGee's work. Um, there's some other work, a great paper from my friend Abhishek Banerjee came out just recently. There's a, a lot of work now showing that um, signals, to, and one could call it top-down signals from one brain area to another seem to guide plasticity. And I think that this is at least indirect evidence for Rui's assertion that there's at least some attempt to cooperate between brain regions, potentially. Uh, I don't know what people make of that assertion, but. Do you, do you think that there is an experiment that would be able, that could be designed either in sort of a systems neuroscience setting or a cognitive neuroscience setting that, uh, you know, either with fMRI or with, with you know, a, 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 a probe that, you, that would actually be able to, to, to distinguish whether there were uh, adversarial or collaborative um, uh, whether there was competition between brain regions that did benefit the brain as a whole or whether it was more collaborative or do, you, do you think that this could actually be this is actually a testable hypothesis uh, again if there's anyone in the audience that that that, that has has ideas for this like we're, we're very much willing to hear this you know this is this is primarily a group of group of theorists talking talking amongst each other and if there are people with um uh, ex experimental ex experimental uh, neuroscience experience would be more than willing to hear from you Silence. <laughs> it's a really tough question. No, like it's yeah, the toughest I think question. it's too general to have like an answer. So like you, yeah. you need much, much, much more precise hypothesis to go to experiments. It's just too vague, which is like Wolfgang's comment that, that our, our, our theories tend to be a little bit too abstract to immediately map into um, into experiments. But but the idea that of, of sort of, of, of having top-down signals guiding plasticity in the lower levels of the hierarchy, for me, that's not, the way I would sort of like abstract away or think mathematically about that operation would be as um, credit assignment backpropagating signals in a hierarchical architecture rather than than different circuits doing different things and helping each other out. Um, it's at this point it's just a philosophical statement. How do you like to think about it? But but that that's how I tend to think about that kind of work. But, but building on Blake's comment, I think there's two types of top-down signals, right? There's the direct excite, excitatory top-down signals, but there's also a more kind of modulatory influence via, for example, VIP engineers, which seem to you know, control uh, plasticity in, in a different way, right? So, uh, so this in turn suggests that there is, as you say, like the normal kind of flow of information, which then you can, you might need to backpropagate information um, through, but then there's also, another way with which you can 
kind of more directly interact with those signals uh, that are already doing their kind of deep learning, as you, if, you, if you wish, um, by you know by controlling the specific engineers. So we, we had Alexander Payer uh, raise his hand. Alexander Payer is a postdoc at Miele. Uh, what did you have to say, Alexander? Uh, yeah, well, just a, a short note about uh, addressing some of the possibilities, like you mentioned, the uh, adversarial, possibly adversarial dynamics in some some region. Because, um, well, we we you've talked about a uh, gradient descent on an objective function. We don't know what the subjective function is, and we don't know whether there are multiple objectives, right? Uh, and one of the problems when we want to validate experimentally what is going on is that what we are recording from typically uh, in the for such a live animal performing a given task is the activity of the neurons right so you uh, what you are recording is the activity and you want to infer from that activity what is going on underneath so you need to to bridge the gap between the neural neural dynamics to the dynamics and parameter space, if you will, the connection between nodes within the, the network. Um, so what you need to do in some sense is to try to find a way to bridge that gap. And so the question is then if you want to verify it or, uh, or disentangle, uh, discriminate between different hypotheses, you need to be able to bridge that gap. So if you say, well, okay, so I measure the activity and I can infer that the weights are always holding a gradient, there's no rotational dynamics in, in what is going on, then there you go. You have a, you, you found a, a way to validate that, well, okay, there's a form of gradient descent in some sense, uh, approximately. Uh, but then I think that what we are lacking both on the, well, especially in the theoretical side uh, and data analytically uh, speaking, is a way to infer the weight dynamics in actual recording in behaving animals in, so that you can validate the hypothesis because there's no way at this point that you can say, because the way we, the, why we do theory typically is to say, uh, we want to create a, a proper context for experimentalists to uh, disambiguate between different possibilities. Uh, at this point, I think we are lacking a way to pick the activity and having a, a definitive test to say, well, there's, there's some form of, at least in that part of the brain at that given moment in that given task, there's a gradient descent that is going on or that there's a, a form that uh, of activity collectively that the neuron are doing that is reminiscent of a gradient descent. I don't have a, a, an answer. I am just, I'm just uh, bringing that point that we need at some point to have a, a validation of any sort of theory. Yeah. Well, actually, we've been thinking about exactly that for for quite some time now. So um, we've been looking at okay, what kind of qualitative signatures can different approximations of BPPT or other um, te temporal credit assignment learning algorithms have at the levels of the evolution of the dynamics of populations of neurons, and whether you can disambiguate some of the levels of approximation um, in that way. It's still very early days, but but I do think that that's the right question to ask if you if you ever want to go to um, to sort of like validation model based comparison of, of different learning algorithms based based on your available neural activity at the moment. Now, of course, that it, it's it's a terribly under constrained inference problem. <laughs> so so uh, you, you can only make a very qualitative. Uh, inferences out of this, um, so you're, you're not going to be able to immediately infer the dynamics of, uh, of, of parameters from from partially observed um, neural dynamics. Um, but 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 it's I, I would like to see more of that. I, I think I think that that's that's something that that as a field we should be thinking a little bit harder on on how to uh, map this into the data that that's actually available. I I just want to second that. So as part of this GAC, I actually think that you know. Um, a discussion on exactly this topic would be beneficial. Like arguably, one of the things that we we really need to do over the next, you know, five to 10 years to resolve this question is to come up with techniques, as it sounds like you're working on, Christina, to, to try to make these inferences about how different learning algorithms should 
impact the kind of signals that we can actually measure experimentally. Yeah. Um, Cause this is the key challenge. You know, I, I've, uh, I've had this funny, like I remember having funny discussions with Yashua Bengio here where he would say, okay, well, what we need to do is we just need to measure how all the synaptic weights are changing in the network. And then he was like, okay, good stuff. Yeah, no, like it's not, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So precisely that, you know, the act, as, as Alex mentioned, things like trying to think about, well, looking for signals of, you know, curl in the activity profile, or maybe trying to look for, um, you know, any indication that say, like say you have a particular theory like that I've put out before that dendrites carry credit assignment signals. Then if you look at how at dendritic activity, you should be able to predict activity changes in the next little bit, right? Um, the, these sorts of things we need to start to think about and, and come together as a community to agree on, on what the standards would look like for evidence for different algorithms. I think, I think Katarina has something, uh, has something to respond to that. She unmuted. No, no, okay. Um, all right, right. I, yeah, I think, I think this is sort of taking an interesting turn. I think um, in, in the interest of time, we're gonna, I'm gonna move on to that, to that second part of the, uh, of the, of the poll. Um, so let me just get back up my notes. Um, okay, so the, again, the audience seems to broadly agree that, that, recurrence, that, that recurrent synapse is a key to learning and memory throughout life. Um, but do, like, do you really think plasticity at recurrent synapse is as important um, during uh, early development, during childhood? Uh, so for example, like learning to walk as it is during adulthood, for example, like learning to be like a better dancer or something. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe Katarina, you can take, take, take that question. Thanks. Um, so uh, you mean whether there's a difference between like uh, essential things, learning to walk and dancing for recurrent synapses? No, I think recurrent synapses are important for anything. So I also voted that uh, plasticity at recurrent synapses should happen throughout life and should not change at all. So I mean, uh, of course, um, during uh, development, there's more inhibition. Um, uh, there's less inhibition and GABA earth ignorance can also be excitatory. So of course, some cha something changes during development, but I don't think that the ability of recurrent synapses to change with age um, should be diminished. Yeah, so I think you sort of you need stronger neuromodulation. I, in, if you think about early sensory representations, you need stronger neuromodulation for changes to happen. But but the mechanics of how they happen once that the the neuromodulation is present are are the same throughout. Um, so so kind of the, the conditions for changing a recurrent synapse is as as they become sort of more crucial for for particular tasks throughout throughout life. Uh, the conditions for changing them get stronger and stronger. So you say like. Um, you know, inhibition becomes stronger, neuromodulation becomes key to, to changing. Um, yeah. So the way yeah, I think I, about, the way I think about it is sort of like in, in, in uh, aligned to what Surya was saying before, as sort of intelligent synapses that, that can change their level of plasticity de depending on their past experience. So a simple mathematical example uh, of that would be the palimpsest synapses that that's the kind of pussy has been proposing um, 10 years ago. Um, so the idea is that the more you reinforce uh, the strength of the synapse, the, 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 so the, the, the harder to change that synapse is. And that, that gives you an interesting way of achieving the, the trade-off between stability and plasticity. Uh, it's also the case that if you go higher than the cortical hierarchy, uh, those are a lot more plastic than, than lower in the sensory hierarchy. So, so the, this happens both within, within circuits and across circuits, that you have multiple time scales. Right plasticity or multiple abilities to, to change. Um, and those depend yeah. on past experience as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think neuromodulation here is key for all of this. I think the, the way I think about it is that neuromodulation is, is providing this control over which brain to change more at a given point in time. Uh, and you know, in the beginning it makes sense that lower brain areas or lower layers can, should change more to, to extract the more primary features. And, 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 and leave the other layers to, to later on in, in life. So, so it's the, this meta learning element that's provided by the neuromodulatory system that is controlling what should change uh, and when. I agree with you. Um, I think though that there's also still plasticity going on in early sensory areas even in adult animals. So there are some studies by Jasper Port and Khan, for example, showing that representations of in V1 can still change 
in adult animals. Yes, conditioned on the presence of neuromodulation, it can still yes. happen. Yes. Okay, that's important, yeah. yeah. So I think Wolfgang uh, unmuted uh, to respond to something there. I didn't have anything to particularly say. I think I'm on a general note. I think maybe we should also consider a little bit you no know, examining or re-examining our kind of you no know, toolbox, you no know, like heavy and plasticity local learning. Because I think Katharina hinted at this already in her talk when she pointed out that inhibition plays a strong role in gating plasticity, right? And it's actually known that inhibition can individually gate you know, different dendrites on the same neuron differentially, right? So it's a very fine kind of regulation tool. And we know, you know that you know, via VIP neurons, which you Nauru know, mentioned, you know, there's this inhibition, right? So there are many more kind of ways how this plasticity can be regulated in a non-local manner. And neuromodulation is somewhat you know, kind of a hammer Maybe you know, we, we, we know it you know, well from reward prediction error. And I think it you know, really appear, appears to me much more complicated, much more multifaceted. So therefore also, I think on the technical level, I think we may also really want to re-examine um, some well-known traditions like having learning is the key and these things, right? Because they already Katarina hinted at this you know, kind of dendritic spikes you know, are often you know, can replace post-thematic firing. So dendritic spikes can be caused by many things, but in particular also by network activity, right? Or they could be inhibited you know, by local things. So therefore there's much more circuit involvement possibly in regulating local plasticity. And this could also be important then, right? No, I, I totally agree. In, in a way there is, you know, this missing fourth factor in these learning rules that, you know, computational neuroscience has looked at, which is the circuits, the neural circuits. And there's these intricate microcircuits that are you know, very well preserved across the neocortex and across species, which you know, strongly hints about you know, some learning mechanisms, some learning principles that are key for you know, our understanding of brain, brain yeah. function. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree, but I, I think that sort of there are mathematical tools, tools that can address that kind of question. So, so we have been looking at sort of the toolbox of approximation, uh, online approximations of backprop through time that machine learning people have come up with um, and thought about, okay, how, if, if you think about those, those computational you know, building blocks, how would you map them into biology? Um, and any of the tricks, those synthetic gradients or things like that, that, that um, all require exactly the kind of biological mechanisms that we're talking about right now. So the, the, they require specialization of dendritic branches for different computational goals. They require um, these different compartments to have different plasticity mechanisms, Th those plasticity mechanisms to be gated by, by local extra circuitry. So I, I don't know that necessarily we need to sort of like reinvent the wheel and, and sort of like throw away the framework altogether. It's just um, maybe we need to be a little bit more inclusive of what constitutes biological plausibility. Um, so I, I think there's actually a lot, a lot of hope in, in terms of reconciling the, the limitations of biological plausibility of these machine learning inspired algorithms with the, the we're not thinking enough about the complexities of biology. Um, th those are kind of, there's a problem manipulation going on there that, that if you're trying to make those more biological plausible, you automatically get the additional biological complexity. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited about that kind of work. Um, although maybe not, not individually true in the details, I think the spirit is, is quite correct. So, I, I, I wanted to add one thing and then ask for um, the inclusion of someone to say something here that got raised in the Q&A. So, so first, I just want to say that I think there's probably wide agreement that the microcircuits are critical. I guess the question is whether you think the microcircuit architectures are there to support better learning or are providing existing recurrent connections that don't need to be updated because they already give a good basis function for doing a lot of different things. And that was kind of one of the things that we wanted to get at here today is would there be a way to, to, to pick apart these two possibilities to, to be able to say empirically, yes, like, you know, the neocortical microcircuit has all these fantastic different interneuron types and stuff, but what they're doing is they're helping to like solve credit assignment or something. 
Or alternatively, is this in intricate circuitry just providing a hardwired basis set that then doesn't really need to be updated throughout life? Which I think is something more along the lines of what, what Tony's advocate, Tony Zader's advocated before. And, and speaking of Tony, I wanted to bring this up because I think to, to get at these questions experimentally, we mentioned a moment ago that we would ideally have measures of synaptic weights, but what we ultimately have is, is different readouts and we have to think about how to make those inferences. But Tony mentioned in the Q&A that there might be technologies coming up to help us this way. I'd be curious to hear more about the state of that briefly, because this is critical for answering all these questions. Because if we had that technology, we could probably answer all these questions much more rapidly. So Tony, if you're still around, um, if you could raise your hand, I'd love to hear what the latest is on, on measuring synaptic weights experimentally. Could you, you, Tony, you Tony, you should be able to speak yeah. now. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hey guys, this has been a lot of fun. Um, been learning a lot. Uh, I, I just threw in a, a sort of um, comment that actually there are cool technologies on the horizon for massive monitoring of at least some forms of synaptic plasticity um, that, that make use of the fact that we know some of the molecular substrate that uh, sort of is responsible for at least some forms of synaptic plasticity. So the particular one that, there, there are several of these, and I'll just talk about one that my lab has been involved with in collaboration with Robert Malino. Uh, so we know that some forms of uh, long-term potentiation involve the insertion of a particular subtype of glutamate receptor. And long story short, you can actually tag those newly inserted uh, receptors in a way that you can then visualize them post-mortem. And so you can, th there's still a lot that's unknown, but you can basically get a little marker or a tag for synapses that have changed probably within the last 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then using um, imaging techniques, uh, you can go and find those synapses, where those synapses are. And potentially in combination with other uh, methods, you could even associate them with their parent neurons and do all sorts of cool stuff. So this technology is, is not yet mature. Um, but there are a lot of people working on lots of sort of variants of that. So I think it's not insane to think that, you know, I mean, biology is biology. We'll never have the perfect data set that, you know, in the same way that we can't uh, record the activity of every neuron, you know, in the brain for a lifetime. But we can now record the activity of thousands and tens of thousands of neurons in the same way I think we'll, we'll probably within the next five years uh, at least if enough people push on it, be able to say within a given brain region that, you know, these synapses uh, underwent uh, plasticity. Can I ask a quick question? Please. Can, uh, can these measurements of changes in synaptic plasticity be, cor be correlated with measurements of functional um, properties of the associated neurons? So... Um, what... what for all these temporal credit assignment kind of discussions, what you really care about, how the synapses change with respect to what the neuron is doing. So it feels like it's, it's very difficult to disambiguate them without knowing what the functional role of individual, the, the sure. associated so, neurons the synapses. Yeah, so, so the fantasy is, um, I'll, share, I'll share my experimental fantasy, is to be able to record from uh, a population of neurons in vivo in a rodent performing some task using uh, record, doing the recording with two photon microscopy and say, you know, here's neurons one through 1000, neuron one did this on, you know, it fired when the, when the animal licked and when the sound came from the left and et cetera. Um, and so now you get a big list of, you know, two photon type functional activity. And then uh, post-mortem, you associate those neurons with their synapses with the synapses they make with other neurons in that circuit. Um, and so you get connectivity and then potentially even the plasticity that a subset of those neurons underwent. I mean, I, I, can, I can write down that experiment on paper uh, using 
techniques that are not, some of which are not quite ready for prime time, but at least we can sort of see how in the next five years we might get there. Okay, so you, you think this kind of like simultaneous both functional and, and plasticity measurements would be possible in the foreseeable five to, well, you know, our retirement? I always say five years because that's, um, <laughs> that's the time horizon of a grant. <laughs> uh, Tony, can I maybe also ask a kind of experimental question? This is Wolfgang Maas. Um, one knows also know that apparently, well, at least no, uh, network activity changes also without learning, right? We know, for example, from the work of Mark Schnitzer you know, that memory traces change over the time curve of, of week. Also, you know, Chris Harvey has shown that you no know, kind of assembly sequence, which apparently encoded you no know, learned behavior, changed a lot you know, over the time scale of weeks, right? And I guess probably also synapses change there uh, without any overt no plasticity involved in there, right? So when you have now these wonderful new techniques and you say, no, okay, these synapses changed, how can we know whether this was due to learning or some degradation of whatever? Yeah, that, I, I, that's a great question in, in some sense because it almost, I think, um, so the, the real answer is no one knows, at least I certainly don't know. I don't, I don't think anyone really knows. Um, but but I, I, I worry that part of the answer is that we use the, you know, words like learning and imagine that they have a one to one correspondence with the underlying synaptic mechanisms right mm -hmm. the synapses are changing all the time. And mm -hmm. I guess if we understand in a particular context why they change we will point at that and say, ah, it was due to learning mm -hmm. and in some other context, we will point at that plasticity and or that change and say it was noise right but of course you know as, as is always the case mm -hmm. in experiments uh, when we don't understand why something happened or if it happened you know sort of orthogonal to the conditions that we control then we will um, assume or uh, attribute that to noise so you know I the, the particular form of plasticity that I'm referring to here is a very well studied form uh, or molecular mechanism that underlies, you know, long term potentiation, or at least some a subset of long term potentiation it, uh, at glutamatergic synapses uh, in brains, right? It's, it's, it's a particular molecular mechanism. It's certainly not the only one, um, but it's the one that is well studied and that we have a handle on. Um, so, so I. If, if I might ask then, so let's let's try to imagine an experiment here. So let's say that you train an animal on some task, you show that it's successfully remembers something or gets better at something. You then demonstrate with the kind of techniques you're talking about, Tony, that there were changes in glutamatergic synapses in some brain region. Let's say the striatum. Sure, striatum, say. Uh, and let's maybe make them recurrent synapses. So between neurons within the striatum. And um, then ideally you would also have another case where say you use the fact that you know about these molecular mechanisms and you disrupt them in this brain region. And you, you show that not only do you not see the changes in the synapses per the measurements you, you make, but the behavior doesn't get better either. Would that consist in at least some evidence that the cha changes in the recurrent synapses in that circuit under were, were responsible for the alteration in behavior that that you observed, which we would then maybe be more inclined to call learning? Sure. So we we did an experiment that was kind of like that. We trained animals to go left or right depending on whether they heard a low sound or a high sound. So this was rats. And then we looked specifically at the synapses from the cortex to the striatum, to the auditory, from the auditory cortex to the auditory striatum. And then we use sort of other physiological, but still in, vi in vitro methods, actually also in vivo, to, 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 to monitor the changes in those synapses over the course of learning and also after learning. And those synapses changed in a particular pattern that reflected the organization of the high and low, the tonotopic organization of auditory cortex to um, uh, uh, auditory striatum. And then actually, uh, 
my former postdoc followed up those experiments and showed that if you disrupt that change, if you prevent that change, then the learning doesn't occur. And we even did just recently some uh, experiments where we did a reversal learning and then actually surprisingly those synapses didn't change. So right. I don't know what to make of that. But so, so the answer, you know, I, I would say that that's an example where you can actually point you know, it's not, I, I can, I can, you know, I could go on and tell you, you know, the, the, the holes in this argument, but, uh, but I think it's, it's a pretty good example where we can point to a particular set of synapses organized in a particular way that at least probably contributes to some as aspect of um, uh, a stimulus response association, yeah. uh, sort of at, at, at synaptic resolution. So, so here's an interesting question. So, so I think, you know, we'd want to do continue to do experiments exactly like that over the next few years to, to answer which synapses seem to be involved in different tasks and, and or learning different tasks, I should say. And then the, the next question that, you know, we would want to touch on based on this GAC here is how could we then determine, and this gets back to Alex's, Alex and Christina's point, how do we then determine once we've identified some synapses that we think really are involved in something we call learning, how do we then determine whether those synapses have been shaped by a, an efficient credit assignment mechanism or not? Yeah, great, great, great question. Because the, the problem is that, you know, the, the, when looking at one particular you know, the, the, the information needed for the credit assignment is happening at sort of a global network level. But, you know, at least in this experiment, we're only looking at one particular pathway, right? right? And so from, from, this, from the point of view of this particular pathway, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think the question is well posed, right? Like, I, I don't think there's some magic new, I mean, there might be undiscovered new mechanisms, but you don't, you wouldn't need to, to invoke a new non hebbian mechanism to explain credit assignment, right? Presumably the synaptic uh, mechanisms are, are, you know, th those have evolved over 500 million years and, and those basic mechanisms are already in place. What, what is allowing, I think all of these proposals to, to work is just the right organization at the circuit level from what I can tell, right? Like the information, the right information has to be in the right place at the right time. And that's a circuit problem. That's not a synaptic problem, right? Yeah. I agree with that. So uh, again, the, these approximations to BBPT, what they have is relatively traditional HEB-like learning rules, but, but like different types of synapses with slightly different HEB-like learning rules and a lot of architectural structure building. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And and you know, I think as Wolfgang pointed out, right? There's a lot of diversity in what's going on at any particular synapse. And you know, this is biology, so you, you do an exp or, or or in any ensemble of synapses. So you know, this is biology. You 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 make a measurement over a hundred synapses or a thousand synapses, and you're pleased that there's any order at all, right? But you know, your points they don't fall along a line. They they fall in a cloud, and then the argument is uh, is that is that cloud enough to sort of say that there's an orderly relationship? And the only time you can, like, you need pretty strong hypotheses to go in there and ask, okay, well, you know, yes, there's diversity, but it's not random, right? The, the reason that, you know, I, I, I predict that there are two classes of synapses, one that changed on this time scale or something like that, like that's potentially testable, but right, like it, whenever there's diversity, it's very hard to make sense of it without a pretty strong, yep hypothesis. I, I totally agree. I think that's where having a good model, whatever that means, of credit assignment is key, right? So you, you want a good model to make key predictions and then, you know, design your experiment to test those specific predictions. For, for example, I predict that in this task that brain area is going to change the most and in particular those microcircuits are going to be involved and in particular those set of synapses, something along those lines where you have a model. I think without the model here, given the, the complexity of the problem, um, you know, yeah, it becomes a really hard question. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. 
I, I, I would also agree with that. And I think it's why it's a very worthwhile endeavor. Sometimes people complain about the sort of generation of ever more biologically plausible algorithms for solving credit assignment. But I actually think it's a useful um, component of this research path because it's what allows us to have specific models that make more concrete predictions than the hand wavy thing I just said a moment ago about efficient credit assignment. You know, if you have a model that explicitly says, I predict that in order to do credit assignment, like the somatostatin neurons do X and this determines plasticity in these synapses, then you can actually go and experimentally test it, right? That's right. Like if you have, if you have a, um, a hypothesis that's that well formed, you could probably test it today. But unfortunately by today, what I mean is today plus the next two to three years and two to three postdocs. And so, you know, if you think about, <laughs> If you think about the, the investment in testing any specific hypothesis, it's pretty significant. So you've got to have a pretty strong prior, you know, I, I started off a project once uh, convincing one of my grad students and I, I or trying to convince a grad student to, to go forward with the project. And I, I started by saying, quoting Shrek, which was um, one of my son's favorite movies at the time. And uh, Lord Farquhar um, was trying to rescue the princess and sending out his knights. And he said, this mission is dangerous. Many of you may die, but that's a risk I'm prepared to take. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem is that, <laughs> as a PI, right, you, let, you, you send one of your questions or postdocs in, in a particular direction. And, you know, like they've just spent three years and, you know, the, the, if the outcome of the experiment is nope, right, uh, <laughs> then they're disappointed, right? So. The, the experiments can't be just a delta function in experimental uh, space. And I think that that's one of the real challenges. Yeah. That, that's why sort of I think sort of like thinking about these approximate algorithms to temporal credit assignment from a computational perspective can actually rarify the space of, of reasonable possibilities yeah. quite a bit. So echoing what Blake was saying at the very beginning, if it can't, like if, if it provably can't solve a, a, a non-trivial statistical task, it's probably not good enough. Um, there are also sort of a lot of, if you're gonna solve a temporal credit assignment well, there are particular variables that you need to compute at least approximately. So um, maybe thinking about what what's, what, what are commonalities across different approximations rather than, than trying to sort of like commit to this is exactly how it works and this is exactly what I'm testing can also be fruitful because the problem is so is so ill-defined and so under constrained. Um, so if, if you don't want to throw a thousand postdocs at the problem, maybe, maybe refining the hypothesis. If, if I could just throw out one other comment, I, you know, uh, and then I'll step off, but um, so, so at one point, um, there was a discussion of the importance of sort of, so how do we know that, well, why do I think that the, that the circuitry, the circuitry that we're born with is so important in this? Well, part of it is that if I train 20 rats to solve the same problem, then all 20 rats for this particular problem um, will, will show sort of the exact same changes at the level of experimental resolution that we have in exactly the same brain area, right? So, you know, the circuitry is at least sufficiently constrained so that we, it, the, the rats don't treat the problem as sort of a generic big network, let's just try to figure out which synapses to change, but they, they all quickly end up, you know, over the course of a week or so, uh, figuring out that the particular subset of synapses that need to be uh, need to undergo plasticity are all, you know, located in a particular brain area, and they should all sort of change in yeah. roughly the same way. And I think that tells us something about sort of how strongly constrained the set of solutions is, at least in this particular problem. And it, and I got to say, it's a very unnatural problem, right? So we have rats poking in a hole uh, and then hearing a sound and going left or right for a reward, right? That's, that's about it, you know, it's intentionally a, a weird arbitrary association that is intended to sort of uh, tap into general learning mechanisms. The, the funny thing is though, Tony, is, sorry, Luke. I, I was just gonna say, I think this is somewhat related to some questions that were coming up in the chat, uh, in, in the Q and A from 
uh, arena about about trying to trying to think about the kinds of dynamics that you would you would expect to see like the the, the what one one sort of constraint that you could think of within uh, within recurrent neural networks specifically is that, uh, that that they should sort of the the sort of way that they're initialized and the way that they are throughout life is that they should be constrained like they they should stay in a certain regime of dynamics throughout throughout life to ensure that uh, you know they don't fall into something that's pathological like excessive synchronization or, or you know, excessive chaos or something um, and so and so and so yeah like perhaps different brain regions are are better you know have have different types of intrinsic dynamics that make them better suited for particular tasks at different time scales um, and yeah, that that would be something that would you know would be well suited to being optimized through uh, evolution like you know from, from the start you, you from from birth or from even um, as, as as an embryo you you would be in, in a state where uh, neurons or neural populations would possess particular types of dynamics so I guess I'd like to put that out to, to, the, to the panelists like do you think that there are um, do you, or what do you think about that question in particular like do you think there are sort of sets of dynamics that are suited to particular brain regions um, that could be present from birth like do you think that's an important feature or is that something that you would learn only during your lifetime like this would be something purely driven by by experience so it is true that you can genetically control a whole bunch of uh, with respect to sort of the like distribution of different ionic channels different types of, of neuromodulator receptors uh, so like the, the, the prefrontal cortex has more dopaminergic uh, d2 receptors than any, anywhere else for some reason um so th there's a lot of biological evidence that that this is not a, a, a like homogeneous mass of, of, of units um, that, that have the same properties. And a lot of the structure, beyond the architecture, a lot of the structure that is probably built in has to do with it, this kind of um, localized properties. And it, it is true, like Irina is perfectly right that we should be exploring more um, how intrinsic properties or what heterogeneity at the level of the, of the properties of the units translates into richer uh, or more more interesting computational function um, that's I, I I completely agree with that um, I, I don't know mathematically how to approach it but 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 it is the right question to ask if I may though I think an interesting question that arises here is the following so so okay let, let's just first of all put off the table the extremes that I think no one actually believes in so no one, I think, arguably believes that the you know, neural circuits are just an undifferentiated mess of completely identical units that all follow the same learning rules and any solution can be found. And I'm sure no one agree, no one thinks, well, probably very few people think that it's all completely hardwired from, from birth, because that obviously can't be the solution for an animal like a human. But um, the question is precisely, I, in my opinion, and this is where the computational work can come into play, are the solution spaces so constrained that you can get away with a very inefficient credit assignment mechanism or not? And, and I think this is something we, we don't fully know yet. Like I have my intuitions about it and, and other people have different intuitions, but you know, my intuition is that although there's the space of constraints is, sorry, the, the space of solutions is surely constrained, which is why you know Tony and his experiments sees similar synapses being changed in across rats. Um, I would argue that that doesn't necessarily mean that you then have arrived at a point where the solution space is so constrained that you no longer have to worry about credit assignment. Because I think that to get to that point, you would have to have circuits that are basically almost completely hardwired to do the task from the get go. No, I mean, you can't do that because you need to solve a whole bunch of tasks and you don't know a priori what kind of tasks you're going to need to solve. So, right. so necessarily you, you need certain degree of flexibility in the space of solutions for that to be allowed. Um, what worries me that from a technical perspective is to what extent one can explain then all the learning that goes on, say, in rodents, in Tony Seda's experiments, really you know via training readouts from a fixed you no know, liquid, which has a basically much uh, fixed dynamics, because in, in our hands, uh, if you have you know, actually in the liquid a diverse set of neurons and synapses with diverse you no know, dynamic properties, but fixed ones, um, training readouts from this liquid you know, is a very powerful tool then, and you have to go way beyond, I think, typical rodent 
kind of behavioral learning challenges to really you not know, tap into this then, right? So if we you know, only look at rodents, you know, this may be the solution. Or we would have to work hard you not know, to think about a learning problem where this would not be satisfactory as an explanation. Let's say all this, you know, just say you no know, concretely projection neurons, say on layer five and layer two, three, you know, they learn uh, using some kind of local plasticity rule, right? You never need any you know, gradients to go through neurons or so uh, any time. And also, I think many experiments are really of the type that a certain you know, kind of cue is associated with a certain behavior, right? You, know, you don't need a complicated you know, reshaping of recurrent networks to achieve this. I, I think this is a really key point, and thank you for raising it, Wolfgang. Like, the reality is that many of the experiments that we do in neuroscience, we design them in such a way that they're well controlled. And there's obviously very smart reasons for doing that. But in doing that, we often create experiments where they are, the learning task is solvable with a shallow system and, and credit assignment is not difficult. And, and this is very common throughout experimental literature. I do this as well. So another interesting question for moving forward on this research question is, do we need to start to design learning tasks for animals as well that are perhaps less well controlled in terms of like counterbalancing everything and being able to say like this was what exactly was was changed in which synapses but which then are more complicated tasks that might require recurrent plasticity and more complicated credit assignment yeah i agree i mean i was advocating from the very beginning to it for this sort of the need to have uh, behavioral tasks that test um, the limits of, of temporal credit assignment experimentally. We, we don't really know in a sort of in a, in a knob controlled way what kind of credit assignment different animals do. Um, yeah. but, but I think that's, that's where it's key to have a good model, right? Because if you now move away from the simplistic experiments mm -hmm. and tasks people have done, you're basically lost, right? Like there's a sea of things you could look at and you know where to look at, right? So that's why you know tasks, tasks tend to be highly constrained, so it's more easier for an experimentalist to to identify where to look at. But if you now have a more challenging, a realistic, naturalistic, uh, relevant task, now I think having a model is is important. Is really really important. I don't know that necessarily you even need a model of learning for for this question to be interesting. I think so. Like, what's the temporal horizon at, at which statistical dependencies in the sensory inputs? can affect behavior, you can pick them up. Um, so, so you can make like, th there are these little experiments where sort of like people do um, odd one out detection. So you, you get little sequences of auditory uh, stimuli and they're repeated in a particular way with particular periods. And you can like once in a while you do something that's out of sequence and the animal responds to that. So that, that tells you that uh, the animal is sensitive to, the, to temporal structure at this particular time horizon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you anything necessarily what the mechanism is, but at least it tells you something about what statistical regularities in the input the animal cares about and can pick out to just, just spontaneously from, from streams of input. Um, so that, that's the kind of experiments that, that the kind of data that I, I would like to have a little bit more on, because I think that restricts the class of algorithms that we need to think about. Um, so. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, we've got Arena Arena Rish who has been uh, uh, sort of in, invited up. Like, does it do, does this sort of answer answer your questions that you posted in the in the Q and A? Like, can you you know uh, the, the kinds of dynamics that you would expect to see and and you know the particular tasks that would be important? I know kind of you're uh, sort of researching a lot into uh, neural dynamics and continual learning, um, sort of two things that are heavily related to to what we've just been talking about. Um, like, how how do, like. Does, is, is this sort of a satisfactory approach, do you think? Arena, are you there? Huh? You might have to unmute her. Arena, right? you're muted. Yeah, but someone else has to. Oh, no. well, someone else has to unmute her? I don't know. It says uh, talking permitted. Maybe, maybe, maybe she's away from the screen temporarily. Yeah. Um, OK. okay. Um, all right. Well. Uh, yeah okay so we're kind of we're kind of coming to the to, to the end of the end of the workshop um we've got about 15 minutes left 
I think like you know we we started talking about like potential potential solutions like TP. I like this I like this idea of um, you know we we start to we start to design experiments that are a bit more free like they're they're perhaps a bit more um, observational in, in the sense of you know like you, you have uh, experiments in astronomy that are very sort of model, like model driven that you that you have explicit hypotheses where you know you you can't you can't control what's what's going on astronomically but um you you can come up with very strong hypotheses about what you'd expect to see. Um, and, and it seems like you can you can sort of treat a, 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 a you can have a, a broader range of hypotheses. You can sort of put put hypotheses into uh, into into clusters and, and and sort of sort of separate them out that way, rather than having to, you know, as as Tony said, have a have a delta function over particular hypotheses uh, in per experiment. Um, so I guess I got were there any other 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 questions in the in the chat that I think is important that that we think are important to address. Um, so, so one thing that come, has come up, um, Tony raised it, Eric DeWitt also raised it, is the, the question of like, what is a recurrent synapse? Um, and maybe that would be also an interesting question because you I could imagine- This is very, very difficult to answer in a very <laughs> yeah. uh, non-trivial way. Um, like, you know, I've, I've, I've tried over the past week to actually address this in its own. It's much harder than it seems. So it, it actually even comes back to a, li a little bit what um, uh, uh, Jao Barbosa suggested, which is you know you just have some big block matrix which makes uh, you know makes every every synapse recurrent and you can treat them all the same, which you know is is, is perhaps a, a bit of a simplification. Um, but yeah, like you you know is typically an experimentalist would say you know a CA three to CA three synapse that's recurrent, but a CA three to CA one synapse that's not recurrent. But you know why? Like there are there are long range loops and there are very local loops in. Uh, like throughout the brain. So, so what if you use that? What if the what if the question is phrased as to what extent do short range loops have to be updated with, you know, efficient credit assignment mechanisms, where short range maybe means you know, uh, just like one or two synaptic jumps that only travel x number of microns or something like that. So like layer two, three, layer five uh, cells, yeah. they would be counting as recurrently connected. Potentially, I guess. Or the different layers, different. Yes. But that's okay. I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I don't, I don't object to the idea that a layer two, three to layer five synaptic connection is part of the recurrent network in the neocortical microcircuit. Uh, right. But I don't know how others feel about that. Uh, Eric would like to add a bit to the question. Um, yeah, go, go ahead, Eric. So um, I think what I wanted to do is so I also um, asked a question that was sort of related earlier, which, which Blake responded to, which is one of the problems here in some sense between the two proposals is defining what's a recurrent synapse such that you can say, okay, if we do something that's um, linear and, and you know, quadratic loss on a reservoir network, I've got the stuff that's recurrent and the stuff that's not or in force, you're, you're doing some kind of separation. So we've been talking a bunch uh, about circuits and the way there is structure. And I would point out that not only is the structure there across say mammalian brains, but actually if we look for functional homology, you see it also uh, between say the insect brains we study in systems neuroscience and, and mammalian brains. So for me, maybe a different way of restating this question about what is a recurrent synapse is something about are some of these synapses recurrent in a specific way for a specific, say, time domain or a specific problem domain, which would allow you to separate the, the larger problem from the unstructured, you know, I just have a large matrix, where you have actually, uh, you know, constraints that are placed on, on elements of that matrix. They might be time domain constraints, they might be problem domain constraints. It seems without doing that, it's going to be very hard for us to think about experiments that would really test this in a way that would map to these different theories and, and, and also to, to bring these, even these different theories together in a meaningful way. I don't know whether that clarified it or not, but that was the motivation. Maybe the one way to think about it is to, to phrase recurrency at the level, at different levels, right? So yeah, there's a recurrency at the level of the local circuits, like a parabola cell connects with another parabola cell and might connect back. There's a recurrency across layers there's a recurrency, you know, across brain areas, right? So, and all these level of, levels of recurrency 
must be playing a role, right? And potentially a role for credit assignments, but maybe slightly different forms of credit assignments. So yeah, it's just one proposal. Uh, I must say I'm really confused by this discussion about recurrent synapses because I don't know a good example of synaptic connection in the brain, which is not part of a recurrent circuit. Can you name one? No, I mean, I, 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 initially, I initially kind of thought, you know, perhaps the, the, the synapses at the, you know, neuromuscular, neuromuscular joints, you know, like those, those would perhaps be the only ones that are unrecurrent. But at least there, no, you have, say in mammals, you have feedback loops in the spinal exactly. cord, right? If a close, they're the always loops, then uh, whenever you take a close, like even no kind of retina to, well, retina to LGN is a good example, but LGN to be one already, you have feedback, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. so I think we're a little bit you know, kind of brainwashed maybe by the power of feed forward networks in machine learning. We work really with different types of circuits. That's yeah, I understand that the a question arises because we want to have a mapping from our working artificial uh, recurrent neural networks mm -hmm. to uh, the biological neural network, right? So maybe we first need to have a more specific theory or, or like we have to build more biologically plausible models to actually understand what do we now mean by a recurrent synapse and then map it onto the brain. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to map any of these models to the brain. And I, 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 I don't think I will figure that one out anytime very soon. But but I do think that there's progress to be made on the on the theory side in, in sort of like what 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 this kind of uh, attempts to make make recurrent neural networks learning work from a computational perspective tell us that there's sort of there's a there's a tight link between um, the kind of cost functions that you're trying to optimize the kind of architectures that that are supporting the the inferential process of the, so the the recurrence um, and the kind of learning mechanisms that that are required for for learning to be efficient in in that setup um, so I, I think another thing that, that that's potentially ripe for sort of like exploitation is sort of like the interaction between, between these two. So for now, we sort of we've completely taken the architecture out of the equation, modulo LSTMs and grooves, which are arguably somewhat <laughs> um, too restrictive and not biologically motivated. But um, there, there are some ideas that, that again come from machine learning, like the Orabia paper from, from a couple of years back, where they're sort of arguing that if you set your cost function right and your architecture right, you can make like proper backdrop through time or so something very close to it be a strictly local algorithm. Oh, where, where you, um, and I, I don't think we're so sort of, we've, we've been thinking about this sort of things. So sort of, we're starting with the premise that, that, that the loss function is whatever, the architecture is more or less whatever and then we're still, we're expecting to find biological plausible maps for for the learning algorithms and i don't know that necessarily that's gonna work out i would agree with that and i think for all of us to move forward in terms of experimental verification it needs to be that we move more and more towards models that have explicit physiological mappings even though I am someone who always pushes back against the idea of trying to do a complete physiological mapping because I think it's useful to have some level of abstraction retractability. Definitely, that's the direction we need to push in. I have one suggestion as a possible outcome, a fruitful outcome of you know, this meeting and you know, this group and this initiative. Uh, because I think we do have the experts for experiments and theoreticians. And I think it would be so beneficial really to list down concrete learning paradigms in a concrete species, in a concrete you know, developmental stage. Because we always you know we abstract over so many things and I think we agreed you know, these things over which we abstract do matter. If we would have instead of you know, some one abstracted learning problems, 10 different learning problems from rodents to humans where we look exactly what was already known, what did the what was the brain already able to do before this particular learning task took place? Then maybe we have a different passing of the problem and then should you know, adjust our learning models and our theoretical questions according to this then. Yep, I, I agree. I mean, I think that would be something I don't think we're gonna do in the next three minutes, but that would be something that we should try to generate over the next year kind of thing as a ground level entry into solving these problems what are the, the specific tasks and specific species um, 
that we we could use to, to think about these issues. And, and that would then make it more concrete also in terms of the architectures, if we knew something about which circuits seem to be important for those tasks. So how do we as a field arrive at some agreement about what those tasks should be? Like, I don't know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What, what can we do to, what are the parameters that we wanna see? Like what we've, we've talked about one, which is that ideally there, we get, we start to get tasks that are more complicated than can be solved by a simple single layer neural network. Are there any other parameters that we'd wanna see or uh, properties rather of, of such tasks? Yeah, time is important one, right, for, for this particular. Uh, right, yes, okay, so there has to be some. Horizons. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think natural foraging behavior. Like so, so tasks tasks that observe sort of natural naturalistic foraging behavior. That's, that's something that is is common across across many species, and different species have different uh, solutions to this problem, uh, de depending on their own depending on their own needs, like whether they are insectivores, whether they are you know herbivores, and so on. Um, and so and so look, looking at looking at tasks and de designing environments that that you know st still motive motivate. Um, Organisms to, to express their natural behaviors, but can still learn learn within them. So so learn to uh, learn where particular sources, like good sources of, of, of food are, like good good sources to forage at, and, and how those how those change over time. Um, that that could be a, that could be a good good starting point, um, and allow some cross species uh, comparison. Um, yep, I agree. I also think. Um some more complicated motor tasks would be another thing that can be added to this, obviously, because this gets back to Tony's point the, the solution space is constrained. We know that. So they have to be tasks that we can reasonably expect the animals to learn. Foraging is a good one. We can reasonably, reasonably expect animals to learn that. I would argue that reasonably complicated motor control tasks are also things that we can expect animals to be able to learn. Um, and so they should be tasks that require sequences of movements to get the temporal component in but non-trivial sequences of movements that require a lot of practice. And this is the other thing that I would put in there as well. I think often, and I say this with some uh, sense of what an evil thing this is to say, often experimental neuroscientists pick tasks that are fast for animals to learn because that's how you get the most data most rapidly. And I've done that myself as well when I did experimental neuroscience. But probably for these sorts of tasks, we actually want tasks that take many trials because that, that is precisely the kind of complicated task that, that we're interested in here and which would require non-shallow learning. Yeah, so, so maybe there is something that, that's a point where we can again look at the machine learning. Like one of the tasks that I often use, you know, when we, you know, students start playing with recurrent networks is this delayed addition task. And, you know, it's super simple uh, but it, it really needs to, a good uh, credit assignment across time, right? Yeah. Uh, because you need, you nice need to. Too. Yeah. So uh, you know, maybe that's that's where we can maybe look at this kind of simple task and that really needs a good temporal credit assignment and bring them into neuroscience a bit more explicitly. I like that. It's also true that a lot of the machine learning tasks that people like benchmarks that people use as as this is sort of an approved for temporal credit assignment, they're actually not requiring all that much cre temporal credit assignment, like the mimic ta task when you're trying to train a network to reproduce the behavior of another network. Right. Because yeah. the network dynamics are deterministic, you only need to do one step ahead prediction and you're right. perfectly fine. Yes. <laughs> so stuff yeah. like that. So I, I think it's worth thinking about what are minimal tasks that do actually entail um, dependencies over time that are non-trivial and, and so to require more than one step ahead prediction. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, that's definitely. that's a good point. I like the ad task. We should do the ad task with rats. <laughs> we should. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't sound too complicated, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know nothing about the, men, the mental space of rats, so I don't know what's hard <laughs> to train. You know, it's essentially like a working memory task, right? Uh, where you have some distractors in the middle, maybe a lot of distractors to make it extra challenging. Uh, but that's it. <laughs> So I, I think I think we're going to have to to wrap up there. Um, like this has been this has been uh, an amazing amazing way to kick off this kind of collaboration. Um, 
I hope, I hope everyone in the audience has enjoyed this as well. Uh, like the one thing I, I, I would ask of you is to, is to go back to the, the poll that we set up and to, to vote again. I've reset the results. So if you have changed your mind at all, like maybe we can see some differences in that in those distributions. Um, but yeah, like thank you all for coming. And um, uh, yeah, we kind of look forward to updating you on our progress in, uh, in, in the coming year's time. Uh, so yeah, I just want to say thanks to the speakers, Blake, Rui, uh, Wolfgang, Katharina, and uh, Christina, um, and also to the other contributors, um, Anto, uh, uh, Tony Zedel, uh, Surya Ganguly, and uh, Guillaume, Guillaume Lejoan and Irina Risch, uh, who, who all contributed in, in part and Alex. today. And, and, and Claudio Clofat, who, who gave lots of yeah. comments on, on, on our workshop setup uh, during, like in, in preparation. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Well, we should we should thank you as well, Luke. Right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You have been the leader. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks to the organizers. Was a great yes. initiative. Yeah. Th th thanks as well to, to Joe, Anna, Ellen, Franz, and Roy, who who helped a lot with kind of organizing this too, and, and taking notes and kind of the back and forth with CCN. And thanks as well to the CCN to uh, to Eric and to Megan and uh, Gemma, who've yeah been amazing in, in putting this all together. So thanks very much, and and good luck with the. With the grid codes workshop that's coming up in half an hour uh, that'd be worth sticking around for if you have a another three hours that you'd like to to spend listening to to, to talks like this yeah we, we we really appreciate the work you guys have put into this i mean it's absolutely amazing to see um the energy and and the effort that have been put in you know when we when we started this project uh we had no idea whether people would accept the challenge because obviously we couldn't provide much more incentive than, than helping facilitate this forum. And it's been absolutely amazing to see um, what's come out of it so far. I'd like to remind everybody in the audience um, who's left, uh, who's stuck it through the three hours, that you're probably the kind of people who should continue engaging. Um, this, this workshop will continue. The people in front of you are going to continue working on this. If you have ideas and thoughts, please continue to provide them with, with feedback. And uh, we, uh, at CCN would like to encourage everybody to continue participating in this process throughout the next year. Um, we don't know exactly what other events we may um, ourselves support and, and what the workshop um, uh, organizers will support, but uh, we look forward to seeing you. And if you want, come back in about 24 minutes for uh, another wonderful CCN general adversarial collaboration on, on grid codes. Looking forward to seeing you then. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.